Hello, 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 hello. Just checking in before we officially kick things off to make sure that you guys can see the stream, that you guys can hear my voice, all right? It's all good. Sweet. <clears throat> Hello, Ash. How are you doing? So it looks like we've got... I'm trying to see how much lag we've got. Well, it looks like we've got about 18 seconds worth of lag, which is <clears throat> not great. Could be, could be better. Could be worse. Cosmonaut Crash, how are you doing? Good to see you, man. I'm doing all right. I had a. Uh, had a had a good day. It's always Friday, so it's 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 always nice. It's always nice to be Friday. <clears throat> what about you? So before 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 we um, kick things off, I'll just wait. Maybe another. It is Friday. <laughs> it is. What a day. Um, we'll just wait for maybe a couple more minutes just to, for people to kind of um, come in and, and settle in. <clears throat> I've been debating. Um, Fridays are, I think, a, a good time to stream. Uh, it's you know about supper time and where i am right now it's it's um 5 p.m where i am i'm in eastern and i've been wondering i don't know i don't know what the um the spread of people across the globe if they're in a similar time zone or not and i've been debating if or what i'm wondering if is this now a good time and a good day for streaming for you guys um somewhere between cooking dinner cleaning the toddler tornado and wrapping up some work so it doesn't quite yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i i um i 100 hear you on that one so yeah um <clears throat> i don't know, i i haven't thought about actually polling people on on reddit or or whatnot to to see what they think but i know i I know for me it's a really good time and I think for most people Fridays is probably the better time Friday evening like this um, because then you know it, it goes into Saturday on the next day so it's it's in my mind I think probably a pretty good time this is one for me I'm not exactly the busiest person <laughs> it's all right so what we'll do is um, what time is it about about 10 past five or 10 past roughly so i guess we can uh we can we can get going i uh last time around we we discussed a lot of the basics of you know things to take into consideration when you're designing a uh, an aircraft in Kerbal Space Program and um, some of the things that you want to keep in mind also in actual designs in real life that, that transfer, translate over to designing airplanes in, in Kerbal Space Program, whether they're air breathing or rocket powered like, like our XSP-2B here. And really quickly, one of the things that we had touched upon was 
was this equation, right? So this principle where, uh, if you'll recall, we call those moments. Um, and basically, like if you think if you think of what torque is, um, if you think of a of a lever like a wrench or something like that, right? The greater the distance, uh, and or and or greater the force, then the greater the the torque produced is. And we went over how that equation translate to m, which is the moment the the torque applied is equal to force times the perpendicular distance, right? So we had covered that last time around, and we talked about how for something like a uh, the positioning of the landing gear on an aircraft, how some of the basic design mistakes that I see people making is the location of the landing gear just because the tendency is always to put them really far back, and you end up really reducing the amount of the pitching moment that your ailerons will produce when they rotate this try and pitch the airplane up because your pivot point is on the gear and so the 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 moment caused by the weight of the aircraft ends up being really large and the pitching moment by the elevon ends up being really small and then the aircraft becomes really hard to to rotate and, and get it to take off and so we, we that was one of the major things that we talked about but um, during the past week I realized that uh, there are a couple of things that I meant to talk about that I forgot. So I just really wanted to, I don't want to go over like everything we talked about last time because again, the stream is up on the channel. If you missed it, my recommendation is, is just take the time and go and watch it. Um, <clears throat> because this, the, this, the, you know, the, this stream is supposed to be about us going through the design of an upper stage for a rocket and um, I had kind of hinted at this last episode um, that I was thinking of maybe designing an upper stage for the Atlas with the XLR99 engine. I meant to take more time this week to actually try and probe that deeper to see if it's actually doable or not. And I, I more or less had the opportunity to do that. So I meant to be a little bit more prepared than I am right now with the stream. I'm just so that we've 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 got a good pace going, but it you know it it might be really interesting to kind of go through that exercise and we'll do that together a little later on. But for now, I just wanted to make sure that I, I covered the items that I thought were important also to consider when des doing designing an aircraft that I had um, missed or overlooked um, last time around. One of the things that's super important that I did not, if if I remember, talk about is the relationship between where your center of lift which is this blue dot here is located with respect to the center of mass um, I think I talked about that I don't remember but let's just say I didn't and let's just really quickly go over it again there are two in real life and you can also model this in Kerbal Space Program but there are, there are two major aerodynamic profiles that aircraft are designed by in real life. Uh, one is a, a, a naturally stable design, and the other is, what, is what's called relaxed stability. So if we look at the, the former, the first, um, a naturally stable design will have, I'm, so I'm actually I'm gonna do this this way instead. I'm, let's not do that. So roughly here. What I'll do, I'm just going to use something as dead weight to shift the center of mass around just so that we can very easily. <clears throat> so disregard this, this does not currently exist on the plane and should not be considered as being a part of the aircraft. Um, so the normally stable or normal stable design on an aircraft has a profile like this. I'm just going to exaggerate it a bit where the center of mass is ahead of the center lift. Now, remember that when the aircraft is flying, the lift produced by the wings is expressed at a single point, which tick, it's a dynamic point because depending on, on, the, on your alpha angle, which is the, the, the angle that the plane is, is 
is um, what's the word I'm looking for? Is uh, flying at the attitude of the aircraft. It'll change, and depending on airspeed, and there's variable factors. But for the sake of the conversation, let's just assume that it's quote unquote fixed. So the normal stability, and this is what you'll see in pretty much every airline, every cargo plane, um, your Cessna 172s that you're going to take your pilot's license uh, courses on. The overwhelming majority of aircraft have a normally, normally aerodyna stable aerodynamic profile where the, the center of mass is ahead of the center lift. And what that does is your pivot point in this case is the center of lift, right? Because all of the lift, you can sum it up as pushing on a single point longitudinally across the aircraft, which is expressed by this guy, the center of lift. Much in the same way that your center of mass, the yellow one, is the expression of the sum of all the different components on the aircraft that are producing the overall total weight or mass of the aircraft. Um, by having the center of mass ahead and by having, let's just add our little vectors like we did last time. I didn't get any um, negative feedback as to you know using this kind of a system to, to illustrate vectors and stuff. Uh, I didn't get any negative feedback last time, so I'm gonna go ahead and assume that it was a good way of, of getting it to, to work, so we'll just do that again. Uh, let's just shrink this guy a bit. And we'll do like this. This guy's going to be a cone. Bottom. There we go. Okay. Awesome. Procedural tanks for the win. So if you'll recall again, your lift is pushing about the center of lift. And the mass of the aircraft obviously is going to be pushing about the center of mass, right? So if we put these guys side by side, obviously the net distance, if we go back to that moment equation, by having a non-zero distance D, you're going to have a, like the arrow is pointing here, you can see it, you're going to have a tendency of the aircraft to naturally pitch the nose down. Why this is a desirable trait is because if ever the aircraft gets loose or if you stall the aircraft, so when, when the, the angle of attack gets far too high and too aggressive, the flow over the wing will go through a phenomenon that's called separation, flow separation, where because the way an aircraft wing, unless you're talking about a supersonic aircraft wing, but the way an aircraft wing works is you don't see this in KSB, but in real life, like, in, and again, you probably know this, but just really quickly going over it is the shape of the aircraft wing. Actually, let's do um, airflow. Let's see. Airflow over a wing. Uh, this guy's not bad. We'll use this. So this is, you know, very normal kind of flight where the shape of the aircraft it's, of the wing is flat on the bottom and it's curved on top. And the reason why this is done is because <clears throat> if you imagine a particle on the upper streamline and the lower streamline, a streamline being in the field of aerodynamics, the streamline is imagine a river and you drop something like a leaf that floats on the surface, that leaf will follow a specific path. That path is what you call a streamline. So in this picture here, you can imagine where uh, the path is basically every single one of these lines is what you would call a streamline, right? The way fluids behave, if you have a dot 
at this point and another dot that and they're both at the same spot they're going to want to stay sort of together in a way and what's going to happen is the upper streamline has a longer trajectory to travel than the lower one because of that curve right so a straight line is a shorter trajectory than a curved line right if they both have the same starting and end point one of the basic principles that you observe in aerodynamics is as the velocity increases pressure decreases okay i don't know how well you guys can is this a little too small like i'm using notepad but is that too small um hopefully it's it's all right um it's kind of stupid with the stream delay that it's going to take a little while to get a reply for that but <clears throat> i'll explain it i'll i'll, I'll Hopefully it's all right. If not, I'll, I'll just kind of really quickly re-explain it afterwards with something a little bigger. Um, but one of the basic principles in aerodynamics that you observe is this. If the velocity is pleasantly readable size, even... With, okay, cool. So we'll, we'll, we'll go with that, then we'll keep it. If the velocity increases, pressure decreases. And if, inversely, if the velocity decreases, pressure increases, right? So why this matters in this context is because this particle will want to stay at the same point as the lower streamline, but it has to travel a greater distance, it will accelerate. And by accelerating, it will cause a drop in pressure on the upper portion of the wing. Similarly, the lower streamline will, will slow down and because it slows down, its pressure will increase. And what you get there is a net positive result where you produce aerodynamic lift. Incidentally, um, wing vortex. We'll see if we can get a nice image for this as well. <clears throat> Incidentally, also, you'll get around the uh, edge of the wings. You'll, you'll notice this kind of of behavior um, if you've got the right conditions and you can you can uh, notice it but around the, the the tip of the wings all along the wing you've got that high pressure below the wing and that low pressure on top of the wing and when you start getting to the tip of the wing you basically get this swirling effect because there's there's no longer a physical barrier in the form of the wing there to prevent it and so you get this air that recirculates at the wingtips, which is actually causes quite a lot of drag to happen. Um, that's why more modern aircraft designs um, will, and you'll you'll have seen this many many times. Uh, here, this is a pretty good one. You have these these winglets at the top, and see, this actually does a really great job of, of illustrating it. Is that Without the winglet on top, the air is you know high pressure at the bottom, low pressure at the, at the top, and when you get to the tip, it'll rotate like this. And one of the the, the you know if you recall Newton's equations, um, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? If you're doing if the wing is doing work on the air, okay, which it is because it is it is stirring the air at that wingtip. If you're doing work on the air the air is doing work on you that's that reaction part of it what that means in aircraft design is that air that's doing work on you is called drag and drag obviously is not a desirable trait because it slows you down it makes you consume larger amounts of fuels it's a problem right and one of the ways engineers figured out how to do this a while ago is by having these winglets on top here you're re-adding that physical barrier that for the rest of the wing you have, right? And so the air will not tend to recirculate anywhere near as much. So basically this is a huge drag saving or drag reduction design or feature, right? So in Kerbal Space Program, 
and and going back to what we we're talking about the the normally the normal state I, I don't know if this is the right term or not i forget what the actual aerodynamic name for this is but in a naturally stable aerodynamic profile will have this where the center mass is ahead and it causes the plane to want to naturally nose down all the time and what we were discussing earlier before i got into that is is this here if the angle of attack which is called an alpha increases too much because again remember right every time the velocity increases the pressure decreases right so if you increase the angle of attack you're increasing even more that the, the distance that particle along the streamline has to travel and so the pressure keeps dropping you generate more lift but there comes a point where if you do it too much the pressure drops so much that the air then just what goes through what's called uh, a flow separation where it'll do like this and, you, and you'll probably have seen videos of this you, you can very easily google something and and go and see what flow separation looks like. You'll see a lot of time what air, what engineers will do when they're studying this is in a wind tunnel or, or on an actual aircraft, you'll have all these tiny pieces of string of cloth and it's very easy to then get a visual idea of how the flow is behaving on the wing and where the onset of stall is. So if you if you do this too aggressively, you'll you'll induce a stall. So where something like this kind of a profile comes in is the moment this happens so the airplane the flow is no longer f f correctly flowing over the wing and the consequence that that has is it's no longer generating lift your your, your flight surfaces like your elevons and, and ailerons can no longer do their job but what continues to act actively on the aircraft is gravity right and because the gravity is ahead of the center of mass, or the sorry, the center of mass is ahead of the center of lift, what's going to happen is if the aircraft stalls, and you again, easier to find videos about this on YouTube, is you'll pitch up, you'll pitch up, you'll pitch up, the aircraft will stall, and then very naturally it'll do this, where it'll nose down eventually. And this might sound like a bad thing, but this is actually exactly what you want to have happen. Uh, if you said, but it's not because of the upper particle wants to stay there. No, it's true. Like I get it, but it's a simplistic explanation. It's not exactly that. It is a bit more complicated than that. It, you, you're right. Um, you're right, Min. It's not exactly that, but <clears throat> but yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a simplistic explanation, and, and so I yeah, anyways. But yeah, no, you, you are correct. You are correct. So what Min is basically saying is flow separation happens when the upper flow does not have enough speed to overcome the high pressure zone that forms at the back of the wing. Yeah, essentially, essentially that's, that's, that's kind of the idea. But the pressure drops to a point where it can no longer continue to flow and then it becomes detached. And, and But for, for our purposes here, what we basically need to understand is this is the aerodynamic profile that an aircraft will will have under this kind of a profile. So... I would normally recommend that you design your aircraft with something like this. Where you want to be careful with is you don't want your center of mass to be so far ahead of the center of lift that your elevons are constantly trying to pitch the aircraft up. Because again, remember that, um, gonna have to bring this guy down. Remember again that this is the the center of lift is your pivot when you're in flight and so the f the weight of the aircraft is actively trying to pitch the aircraft down um, <clears throat> that's why turbulent boundary layer sticks to the wing more right yeah so a turbulent flow interestingly enough is a more energetic flow and when you observe uh, flow over a wing for you know trying to observe uh, flow separation a lot of times what you'll see is you have things called vortex generators and they deliberately disturb the flow over the wing to cause it to be turbulent because a turbulent flow has a greater amount of energy and so it will tend to want to stick 
and maintain flow over the, the flight surface more than a nice laminar flow. It's a little counterintuitive, but, but that's exactly, you're absolutely right, Thomas. That's, that's, that's exactly what that does. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, having a, so where, where you have to kind of fine tune your design and, and sort of like test it is figuring out what the proper distance between the center of lift and center of mass is. If that center of mass distance is too great, again, remember the moment equation, right? Your pivot is a center of lift that mass is actively trying to pitch the aircraft down. If your distance is too great, so your center of mass is far too forward, too aft, or not, sorry, not aft, but too forward of the center of lift, your plane is gonna be fighting tooth and nail to try and stay afloat by doing this, and then you're gonna have very little pitch authority when it comes to trying to pitch up. So it's gonna be very hard to, uh, very hard to, to, to have a nice, flying aircraft. Did I study aerodynamics? I studied mechanical engineering and I did study some aerodynamics and I also studied gas dynamics which is the uh, the study of supersonic flows which is really massively interesting so like Mach numbers, uh, Mach diamonds, shock waves, oblique shock waves um, and how flow behaves from the transonic and, and supersonic, subsonic uh, regimes. It's really interesting stuff. Aerodynamics is a really interesting field and it's also very weird because a lot of the math that you use is very counterintuitive and also a lot of it doesn't have a solution mathematically speaking. Very famously for this is the Navier-Stokes equation which is it describes in one of the things that's super complicated and one of the reasons why why fluid dynamics is super complicated is you have six degrees of freedom, and <clears throat> it's really very difficult to model comprehensively all of those things. The Navier-Stokes equations is if you study fluid dynamics, you will at one point touch upon um, Navier-Stokes. It's it's super important. It's a if you're not used to doing like algebra or calculus, like you'll look at that equation and it looks like a beast, it looks like a monster. It's really not too bad, but very famously, the Navier-Stokes equation is one of those pivotal equations in the world of physics and engineering that does not have a mathematical solution to it. And yet we are able to use it to do aerodynamics. So it's weird. Aerodynamics is kind of, it's, I have a lot of respect for people who are competent in that field. So anyways, so what you have to figure out when you're doing design on an aircraft for uh, figuring out where you want to locate is one of the things you never, 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 never want to do is something like this where um, your center of mass and center of lift are on top of one another like this. If you have this kind of thing going, you, you will have issues because you need you need to have some ability to exert a force of some kind on the center of mass and right now is that by having both of those two on top of one another it's it's just a bad day so this is something you always should be avoiding ideally if you're getting into aircraft design you know something like this is is going to be decent you're going to have to figure out by t test flying your aircraft to see where you're going with this but having the center of mass slightly forward is a very desirable thing. But again, it depends. It You have to answer the question, what kind of an aircraft am I designing? If I want a stable aircraft, then you're going to want to have something like this, but again, not too much. If you're trying to have an aircraft that's highly maneuverable, like a aerobatics aircraft or a jet fighter or something like that you actually would want to go towards what's called a relaxed stability in real life the first aircraft to ever implement this was the f-16 both the f-16 and the at the time was it was called the the yf-16 and you had the competitor which was the yf-17 um, and they were competing for the light fighter aircraft contract for the United States Air Force. The F-16 ended up winning and beating out the YF-17. 
They had the F-15, which was which is a slightly older design than the F-16. And the 15 was meant to be the top dog, you know, head honcho, air superiority aircraft, which it became. But it's a two-engine aircraft. It's a large aircraft. It was very expensive. And the Air Force realized that they were not going to be able to uh, have as many F-15 aircrafts as they wanted. So they came up with the light fighter aircraft program to try and compensate uh, that that gap in in having enough aircraft flying and the f-16 ended up being the competitor it's a small aircraft very agile single engine the yf-17 would end would would end up becoming the f-18 which the navy was really interested in but both of those aircraft were the first and and the 16 slightly ahead ever so slightly ahead but both of those aircraft were the first in history to utilize the relaxed stability profile what the relaxed stability profile is, is you have, unlike the normally stable profile, is that the center of mass is actually aft of the center of lift. This creates a very unstable design, which depending on the purpose of the aircraft is either a good thing or a bad thing. If what you want is something like a fighter aircraft where you need to be super agile and responsive, having an inherently unstable design is a very good thing because it means that every input will create a very rapid response and a very noticeable response. The reason why the 16 was the first aircraft ever to do this, the the F-15 does not use the relaxed stability profile. And what happened is computers got to a point. Um, I think also I think also the F-16 was the first to be full fly-by-wire. And that was really the secret what made it possible. What fly-by-wire is, is every input that the pilot through the yoke is inputting, either roll left, roll right, pitch, down, up, whatever. What the pilot is actually doing is he's not actually flying the aircraft he's telling the computer i want to turn left or i want the aircraft to pitch up and then the aircraft will say okay based on your current configuration flight profile speed altitude air pressure and all this kind of stuff I need to move this flight surface this way or that way or this way or that way to get the pilot to the response that he's looking for. So he's basically telling the computer on the plane, I want to do this. And then the computer tells the aircraft, all right, move this, move that. And then the airplane moves accordingly, right? So the 16 and the 17 were the first to start utilizing this kind of a system. And that allowed this kind of a flight profile to become possible because the the issue is by having an unstable design like this you could not humanly fly this without the help of a computer it's just too difficult you're flying on a razor's edge all the time and no human pilot no matter how good could really ever hope to do it so a computer has to to be flying the aircraft it's it's looking at a bunch of parameters thousands of times a second to figure out what constantly updating the current situation right in Kerbal space program and this is a really important um, thing to take into consideration you 100 percent you 100 percent can reproduce this behavior the relaxability when i built this aircraft Um, or the XSP-2, I designed it deliberately with the relaxed stability profile. The only reason, and this is going back from all the way down to, I believe 1.2.2 is when, 1.2.2 or 1.3.1 is when I discovered this. Um, The only reason you can do relaxed stability in Kerbal Space Program is not far. It's not fair in aerospace, although you want to have that mod because it improves the, the behavior of, of aerodynamics in the game. It's the mod Atmosphere Autopilot. That mod is an absolute beast. It is, if you want to fly your aircraft well, it is the single greatest mod you need to have. Um, 
it will do an amazing job at, you can basically input your, your yaw rate, your roll rate, and your pitch rate, maximum allowable lateral Gs and uh, positive and negative Gs. And it will literally, basically, just like a fly-by-wire system, which is intent intended to reproduce, it will fly the aircraft for you. You just have to tell it what you want to do. I want to pitch up and down. And it will fly the aircraft for you within those parameters that you have then established, right? So for the X-15 that I uh, designed, I... I I told it I don't want you to exceed I think it was seven or eight positive or negative G's because the more you increase the G loading the stronger your arrow or your, your structure has to be on the wings right so the mass strength multiplier on procedural wings this or not not even just on procedural wings but every uh, flight surface has this this is really super important to understand how to use um, the you know the the farther right you go the stronger your wing but if you look at the weight of the aircraft it'll shift the weight of the aircraft as well right so depending on what kind of flying you're going to do like if i if i'm doing something like a fighter aircraft or even for the x15 because of those really steep entry profiles that I knew we were going to have to do and I knew we were going to have to do some hard banking sometimes to try and uh, manage a landing. I knew the aircraft was going to undergo potentially really high G loadings. So this value is actually quite high on most of the flight surfaces because it needs to have that strength. If it's too low, what will happen is, and this happened in one of the episodes with the, uh, the XSP-3D, um, where in flight the thing just kind of disintegrated because the aerodynamic forces got to a point where it overloaded the strength of the structure right so i knew that for the x-15 because we were going to be doing these really very aggressive types of flights at times um, this was going to have to be really high right uh, but it increases the weight so it's a trade-off so you have to be smart about how you're doing it so for something like this the the relaxability profile if you use if you use atmospheric autopilot is 100% doable and I 100% recommend that you go in that direction because it'll produce an aircraft that is a joy to fly. It'll be very responsive, it'll be very nimble and it'll be great to fly. Stock SAS is nowhere near good enough to be able to do that kind of flying. If, you, if, you, if you're not willing to use atmospheric autopilot do not go down the route of relaxability. It's going to be a nightmare. It's going to be terrible to fly. I remember having an F-16 replica and I tried flying it with stock SAS and the thing was just un unflyable. It would constantly go into a flat spin. And a flat spin is one of the pilot's worst nightmares where the aircraft literally just begins to tumble like this. It does this. And the reason why this is so bad is because you have no proper airflow over any of the flight surfaces and your aircraft becomes very, very difficult to recover. That actually has happened on a couple of... And you've been talking about... Yeah, <laughs> well... <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, we are going to be going to the upper stages. I'm trying to wrap this up, but I wanted... Uh, like I was saying at, this, at the start of the stream is that I... Uh, I basically went into uh, aircraft design on the last episode and there's a few things that I omitted and I wanted to kind of bridge that gap and, and, and close that chapter up. So anyways, that's that's basically uh, what I wanted to say about that. And really quickly, again, the other thing that I want to talk about is just uh, considerations on uh, ailerons and flaps on an aircraft. Um, if you... Uh, in this one, in this design here, I actually made these a single solid piece. Um, typically, what you would see on an aircraft is something that's more around like this, where you'll have, I'll just move this really kind of quickly, is you'll have something like this where you have, uh, there like that. Uh, I'll just move it like this you'll have two surfaces where the in, inside one will be typically a little larger 
and it will play the role of the flaps. So when an aircraft is taking off or coming and landing, you'll see this on, and you can you can very easily find pictures of this online, but you'll see something like this where it'll be in that position and it's basically under low air speeds, it's trying to generate additional lift because you're flying slow, you got slower airflow over the wings, you got slower lift, right? Um, and the ailerons, which are responsible for causing roll on the aircraft, are on the, uh, the outermost part of the wing. And the reason why you want them on the outermost part of the wing is because, again, if you go back to the, to the moment equation, which is, uh, no, I had written it down. M is equal to force times distance. By having the flight surface at the outer edge, you're increasing the distance because what that distance is going to be is going to be the distance from the center of mass to the center of lift of that flight surface. So <clears throat> by having it further out, you can reduce the size of that flight surface. And by reducing its size, whenever it's doing its thing of you know up or down for roll, you're reducing the amount of drag that it's generating because again as we said a little while earlier if you're doing work on the air the air is doing work on you right and in terms of an aircraft in terms of aerodynamics we call that drag why i did not do this in this aircraft here was this was going to be a straight line flyer it wasn't going to be used to do aerobatic maneuvers and that kind of stuff. The point of this aircraft was fly straight and fly fast in that straight line, right? So I wasn't going to be rolling left and right except if I was coming in for a landing. And at that point, having a bit of drag was actually kind of a desirable feature because it would help me slow down. Um, did I forget anything? <clears throat> no, I think that's what I wanted to cover. Okay, so let's get into the actual point of the stream, which was designing an upper stage. Last episode, I hinted at um, my wanting to potentially design an upper stage. What am I going for? Stretch tank, that's the ST. Um, so the reason why, so we, we've been flying the, we've been flying our, our Atlas Baker for a good part now, a few episodes, and we've, we've got a lot of, of successful flights out of that one. Um, the most up-to-date version that I have, which is the one I'm, I'm loading up here, the stretch tank, that's what the ST is for. That's kind of like my internal naming for it. It's not an, if you look for this name in real life, you will not find it, it does not exist. Um, it has the LR80, or sorry, LR89 and 105 at the NA-5 upgrade, which is uh, what you get out of 1960s, um, 1960s rocketry. And that's all fine and dandy. It's performing really well and it's got, honestly, we'll be able to go pretty far with, uh, with this level of engine technology, right? So the next one would be the NA6, which is not too far down the road. What kind of an increase do we get? We get an, we get a decent improvement, right? We're I mean specific impulse is not improving, but we're we're increasing the thrust from 831 to 800, so about like 15 k, which is not a huge increase. It's what 15 off of 800 is not even a percent so it's it's an improvement but i mean it's not a huge improvement and if we look at this guy here the na-5 <clears throat> is what we currently are flying and it's 366 kilonewtons versus the next one which would be 373 which is an increase of seven which is again very very small so we're not going to even the next one here um, which is 65 so uh, they are upgrades, they are improvements in performance, but really um, we'll probably be rocking this um, level of performance for the next little while. Um, <clears throat> where 
where this is currently problematic is this upper stage here, which is our Baker upper stage. I in no way regret the use of the XLR11 engines because they've been very good to us and <clears throat> There's a couple of really desirable features and, uh, that these guys brought, which is why, you know, when I was looking at the available options early on for engines and I was um, considering what to go for, uh, in real life, the early uh, Atlas rocket was the Atlas Able, and it... <sighs> did a job just fine but again it's it was really the able upper stage was very early tech and what eventually did replace it and was a huge success is the agena upper stage which was actually a military design and then nasa heard that they were doing that and they got in on the action and the atlas agena was used for a lot of stuff um, the holy grail of the atlas was eventually the the centaur upper stage um but yeah, <clears throat> so I decided to kind of take my own alternate history on it and, and design an upper stage with the XLR 11s. And there were a few reasons for that. One was being um, we had a lot of flight data on it already uh, off the off the start, just because of the X-Plane program that we had been doing. We had the reliability from the start was like 99 point something percent. Uh, both in terms of ignitions and in terms of uh, actual reliability in terms of burn time, right? So you've got 99.8% base reliability and 99% ignition reliability, which for early tech is exceptionally good. Like even when you get into later to kind of technology, hitting that kind of reliability is really difficult, right? So I knew that by going with these engines, we'd have a very proven and trustworthy, dependable uh, power plant to use for, to use. And also by having uh, these engines, we have multiple ignitions that would be available to us. And when you're trying to get in, when you're starting to get into orbit insertion kind of stuff, you know, translunar insertions or uh, dual payload, uh, you know, kinds of missions where you're, you've got two satellites that are going to slightly different orbits and stuff. Having a restartable upper stage is really, really, really very helpful. It's not, it's not mandatory. You can do it other ways, but it's a lot harder to do it other ways. And on top of that, to make it even sweeter is that these guys are actually um, throttleable engines, which when you're trying to do some orbit insertion or fine tuning, having a throttleable engine, it's not like a huge thing that it's not like a world changer, but it's a very nice to have feature, right? Um, in real in reality, th these guys were never used on a rocket; they were always just used on rocket planes. But you know, this is KSP; we can kind of um, go on go out on a limb on that. Um, just looking at the at the chat real quick, we've got we've got a good we've got a pretty good turnout this time around, um, more than twice of what we had last time. So uh, we've been at it for about fifty minutes, and I haven't said hi to anybody. But um, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Um, it's really great to have you guys, and um, it means a lot to have you on the stream. Um, I hope you you'll enjoy it. I do keep an eye out on the chat every now and then just to make you know if people have questions and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, you know, I will I will do my best to answer those. So why, if if this is such a versatile <clears throat> upper stage, why then am I looking to replace it? Well, the number one drawback for this guy is. Uh, we've got the most upgraded version of the XLR11, and uh, that gives us a specific impulse of 225 seconds in vacuum, which is, it's not bad, for especially early on, but it is anything but great. Like, it's not, it's not a great number. And why that's a problem is it means that for the amount of Delta V, you know, bang for the buck that we get out of this guy, it's heavier than what we, we could be getting with a better, more efficient stage. And why that's a problem is 
we're losing a lot of efficiency out of this stage because now this guy has got to push a heavier upper stage just to get the kind of delta v overall that we need right so by having a better lower stage or, or second upper stage um, then we can we will improve the overall performance of, of the rocket without having to improve the um, performance of the of the lower stage um, so what I was considering uh, is right so we've got a few options open to us and I, I put these in a side-by-side -side comparison in my mind these are all the options that are available to us what we are currently flying is the XLR 11 and you've got some of the specs there um, if we were to follow history we would uh, use the Agena upper stage um, why I am hesitant to use the Agena upper stage at the moment is there are a couple of reasons or two reasons reason number one is that we, we do not have with the earlier versions of the Agena uh, more than one ignition uh, we've got a limited number of ignitions and I would like to have that capability maintained where we've got more than one because again it's a very 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 use, useful feature to have um, I can't see it here let me get it here so the Agena is specific impulse wise we're at 276 versus a 225 on the XLR 11s which is an improvement of 51 seconds which is very noticeable and that's a very desirable trait um, it's got storable propellants which is very nice but having just that one ignition is not great and the other thing is the reliability is really not fantastic right at full flight data our maxed reliability is 92 percent and the max ignition is also 92 percent which is far 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 from being atmospheric autopilot has a rocket mode well time to play dinner <laughs> hey cheers cosmonaut thanks for uh, joining the stream um no atmospheric atmospheric autopilot does does not have a a rocket mode it's strictly a fly-by-wire thing but you can use it to fly space planes 100 i've done that many times in the past and it is the best in my opinion um so the agena upper stage is at this point i'm not a fan uh, liability is too low and that single ignition is not something i'm too fond of next on the list would be the aj10 um, <clears throat> 278 versus 276 so we've got we've got a nice noticeable improvement on specific impulse um, very good and um, uh, it has yeah unlimited unlimited ignitions that's a very interesting and desirable characteristic very very nice um, subject to all edge, that's really not a problem. That's something that you can very easily overcome by just having a set of RCS thrusters on there. They will never be subject to all edge, which is why you always want to have these because they'll give you that push to settle the fuel, right? Um, so the AJ-10 is, in my opinion, and if I had to choose between the two, I would go for the AJ-10. It's got that, I mean, two seconds of specific impulse improvements it is this is less than a one percent improvement so there's no there's no gains to be had there um, <clears throat> uh, it also has storable propellants it's using the same propellant so again those are desirable characteristics where this guy really beats the agena hands down is it is uh, is the unlimited ignitions in terms of reliability it's still kind of low um, at max data your ignition is at 97 which is not bad you know it's only three percent away from from a hundred percent but you'd be surprised how often that three percent can come and bite you right um, and 95 second 95 percent total reliability is 
certainly respectable. Uh, again, I'm it's we could potentially go and get something a little better. Um, next on the list, um, and these are two engines that in real life were never actually flown on a rocket. The XLR99 was was the engine that propelled the X-15 to fame and glory. That was the big engine that really all the speed and altitude records were accomplished by this guy. Um, and I thought it might be interesting to use this one for a couple of reasons. Um, there's three reasons. Four? Yeah, I, I, we'll say four. Um, reason number one is our specific impulse is right up there with these other two guys. So, you know, we're, we're par for the course there. We have six available ignitions off of this guy. So it's not, it's not unlimited like this guy, but it sure as hell beats the single ignition we get off of the early Agena engine. Um, and honestly, the XLR11 that we're currently using on the Baker upper stage has four, and I've rarely had to use ignitions more than four times. Six is going to be golden. Like honestly, having six ignitions is great. So that's the second reason. Reason number three is it's got pretty good reliability. Um, at max data, we're at 99% and ignition is 99.6%. So very, very, very solid numbers. We are uh, well above what the AJ-10 mid will give us. And we've got some pretty good thrust profiles. And this engine is also, uh, it has a variable throttle, which uh, in some instances uh, is very uh, pleasing to have in terms of, of it's, it's a nice feature to have again. The, and it's got also this ridiculously long burn time, right? It's rated at 2,700 seconds. Um, and what that means is the mean time between failures, so the the average amount of time in between every failure will tend to be very large, very great, which gives, so all in all, this kind of it gives us the possibility of a very good, um, long-burning, reliable engine. Um, the two major drawbacks for it, and maybe even in, I'd say three major drawbacks for it is, the weight is kind of heavy at at almost half a ton at 0.4 it is significantly heavier than these other guys right like if the agena is point point one three, and i think the aj10 is somewhere somewhere around the same values but at the same time 35 kilonewtons is a very low thrust number and in comparison to the to this guy here at vacuum uh, is 227 up to 262 um so our our upper stage and, uh, and we'll get into like a really kind of quick graph to to talk about some of the things you need to consider when designing an upper stage um in terms of specific impulse thruster weight staging sequence and that kind of stuff um you know if you look at something like the Agena, it's got it's got twice the thrust as the AJ-10, right? Um, and that actually becomes a factor for when you stage your upper stage. Um, the lower you, you your staging sequence happens, typically the greater the amount of thrust you need to have on your upper stage to compensate. Uh, we'll get into that a little later on, but I'm not completely sure this would be a really good candidate. Um, I'm thinking about having it as a second stage, but I'll, I'll get into sort of like the, what I'm the mindset that I'm I'm looking at. But um, the one thing that's kind of really making me hesitate about using this guy is it's just it's that mass, right? If we wanted to replicate similar thrust values by this guy, we would have to you know double or tri or triple up, even quadruple up on this guy, and at that point we would. We would be heavier. Um, your thrust to weight is 64 off of this guy versus a thrust to weight of 40. So the amount of power being produced by this engine res with respect to the actual weight that it has is, is much better on this guy. 
but is that we won't always necessarily need to have that kind of high thrust. But it's it's anyways. Everything in engineering is about trade offs. Um, the next engine that's really of interest to me that I would like to use as uh, a third stage potentially to the XLR99 being a second stage engine is the Junus. Uh, Juno 46K. This is an actual engine that was actually designed. It was never actually flown, but there were proposals for an Atlas Vega design uh, that that utilized it. Um, one of the interesting things about this engine is it has again a very nice and long burn time at 450 seconds, which is very interesting. Uh, it has it has I think it's three. Uh, let's go back in the game. This is the one. Yeah, it has three ignitions. So three is not great. I have on some instances relied on that fourth ignition off of the XR 11s but three is really, is far from being bad. Like three is if you plan your mission correctly is very desirable. It's a good number to have. Specific impulse at 300 seconds, we are 22 seconds higher than the XLR 99 and 24 seconds higher than the AJ-10. This is, once you hit 300 seconds, you're starting to get into a very interesting regime, like a very interesting sort of, of, of um, efficiency. It's also got storable propellants in nitrogen tetroxide and hydrazine, which is really nice to have, which the XLR-11 does not have because it's using liquid oxygen. And if you're doing something where uh, you know you've got to coast for a while and then perform another burn like you're like transferring to another planet or transferring to the moon having liquid oxygen on board unless you've got a lot of insulation on your tanks is not a good thing because you will get boil off you will lose delta v values which is not great <clears throat> Um, and yes, uh, as I don't know how to say that name, but as someone in the chat pointed out, the XR the XLR ninety nine does not have gimbals, which is another challenge to have. But um, neither do these guys, and that's why you've got this kind of RCS setup where all of the navigation and attitude pitch yaw roll is being accomplished not by these engines, but by the uh, by the RCS here, by the reaction control system. And that's what these tanks are for, is that they contain the RCS fuel used by the RCS to, to navigate the um, the upper stage. Um, things we need to consider when designing an upper stage is, I'm gonna show you my <clears throat> my paint skills. This is not going to be to scale uh, by any means, but it, it'll be good enough to sort of illustrate the profile or the idea here of what I'm, I'm trying to get at is, uh, so if you imagine, um, I guess we can call this, um, we'll call this time and what I mean by time is I mean I mean flight time. So if you imagine where T zero T zero would be when the rocket takes off, and then this would be um, T F we'll say, which is you've reached orbit. Um, and the the vertical axis will be this is supposed to be a T will be the thrust to weight ratio, or alternatively, you can kind of consider it as being power. Okay, so that is a supposed to be the letter P for power. Typically, um, the further along you are on your your flight, um, the less the less power you you need, right? So if we imagine that you've got, this would be the first stage, and then you'd have your second stage, and then alternatively, you could potentially have a third stage. Um, so if we, if we imagine that we've got a three-stage rocket, the further, and the point, the point of this graph is just to illustrate this one purpose where the further along the flight you are, 
right? So time is moving in that direction. The further along the flight you are, the less of a need for power you need to have and this and the less amount of power you would want to have and the reason for this is is very simple it's if you look at what the equation for work is okay work is the letter w f is a force applied so in this case it would be the thrust and then d is a distance um you're taking a rocket and you're moving at a certain distance or you're applying a force and, you, and you're covering a certain amount of distance or you're doing a certain amount of work. Um, regardless of the, of, of the power that you're applying or anything like that, um, this equation will always stay the same. Why this is of concern to us is that if you factor work over time, so if you add the variable of time to the equation of work, what you then call that is power. So that W here is the W that we had for this equation here, which is work, right? Where did my equation go? This. So um, power is work over time. So if you're doing the same amount of work, so you're taking a rocket and you're putting it into orbit, if you do it in half the time, again, this is a fairly simplistic explanation but if you're doing it in half the time that means you've used you need twice the power to do it right so the why this is of consequence for our conversation now is more power typically means a less efficient process normally the two are going to be um uh how can I say the two are uh, at odds with 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 each other typically um, if your if your power requirement goes up your efficiency this is supposed to be the Greek letter mu um, goes down okay because you're having to work a lot harder to do the same amount of work over less time so you need more power, which requires more energy, so it's wasteful. So why this is of consideration for our conversation here is what you need to understand from that is when you're, you're at first you need a lot of power because the rocket is, uh, let me get my pen back, you know, the rocket is, is standing vertical. So it is directly fighting against the weight because of gravity, right? It's a one-to-one, -one, and you're going to need to have a minimum thrust-to-weight ratio of at least greater, not equal, but uh, if it's equal, it's bad. You're going to have to have something greater than one, or else it, it, it will not overcome the force of gravity, right? And all of you know this. This is very basic. But as, as the flight proceeds, um, the rocket is going to start to to turn right and as it's turning um you don't need that gravity vector st is still pulling down but the thrust vector is at an angle now and you're not fighting gravity as much you're not directly fighting it the rocket also weighs less because you've burnt off fuel um, you're not fighting against aerodynamic forces as much because typically by that point you're past max q right so what you you want as you start as you continue to proceed along the flight the flight time and you're hitting from your second or your first to your second stage is you can start to bring the thrust to weight ratio down and, and so the tendency what you want to do is you want the thrust ratio to come down um, but you want your your efficiency on your engine uh, on your stage to go up, right? It's less of a problem if your efficiency isn't great on your first stage. What you really need there is power. And that's why typically um, rockets that will use a combination of uh, solid rocket boosters to help in that first f portion of the flight, solids are not used when you need great efficiency because they won't give it to you. But what they will do is they'll give you a lot of power, which is what you need here. 
you don't need that kind of power when you're at this point of the flight you need it when you're at this point of the flight right and this is something that i've a mistake that i've seen a lot of people do is they're at later parts of the flight like this could be when you're doing tli or when you're transferring say to to mars or something and people are just using these really high thrust engines like their stages look like they're designed here rather than here and typically what they'll do is a couple of things one is you'll have a heavier engine which adds mass to the craft which makes you waste more fuel and because it's so powerful you're basically um you're you're uh you're not respecting what we talked why is it not grabbing it there we go you're, you're, you know, you're not respecting the principle that we covered earlier, which is if power goes up, typically uh, efficiency goes down. And the further you are along your flight profile, your emphasis should be on efficiency, not on power. Power is just an early flight thing because you've got the worst amount or the largest amount of forces that you need to overcome so the further down you are efficiency is where you're going at so these are things to consider um i'm just going to give this a temporary name so there's there's a couple of things i want to do here is we're going to go over designs that exist that i want to look at and show you guys that i think would probably be interesting in terms of giving it a profile and the other thing too is um i'm putting temp here because i have not found a name for what we could call our new upper stage. Uh, so I'm giving you guys the opportunity to maybe come up with a name that I'll I'll go and use. So let's get into uh, some of the designs that I looked at that I thought were kind of neat. Neat. Um, the actual Atlas Vega looked something like this, and I actually I don't know about you guys, but I I really like the design. Um, up to this point. So you have your inner stage here. The Atlas part of the design is up to about midway here where the tank will will dome. Charlie, continuing the Baker name. Yeah, I thought about naming it Charlie for Atlas Charlie. Um, I think we could, I would like to break that part of it. Um, I think we could probably do better than just continuing that naming scheme. Um, I'm not against it. I just think there's probably something a bit more interesting um, than, than calling it Atlas Charlie. And I don't know why, but for some reason, I kind of find that it sounds, I don't know why, but I find it sounds a little odd. So um, I don't know what you guys think, but what I, what I really like about this profile is the way it, um, progressively tapers in and I really enjoy the look that this has and I'm I was thinking that our next upper stage uh, will keep the same Atlas base with the 1960s tech for these guys but we could have a second stage and we'll have to pick a power plant for that, either either the Juno or the uh, the 99. If we're using Junos for the second stage, that we will we will have to stack multiples of these. Um, some of the uh, so you'll see here in this guy that the Atlas Vega there was a street a three stage variant that used this is where you had this is like you had this the third stage and. Yeah, that might not be a bad idea. Referencing the constellation that Vega is a part of, uh, definitely there could be something interesting there that we could um, that we could look at. Um, I actually have not thought of that, and I haven't looked into it, so we could definitely uh, check that out. <coughs> so, what I had in mind is we would design. A, a second stage that could either depending on the mission we're trying to do operate as the final stage or as the in-between stage to having a third stage because I don't dislike having something like this where 
that third stage would use the Vega engine because at 300 seconds, it's got fantastic specific impulse, um, especially at this point in the uh, tech level that we're at. And uh, it's got low thrust, which is, which is great for having an engine that you want to use when you're doing something like translunar or transmars or whatever interplanetary transfers right um, <clears throat> following the same logic that we had on this graph here the further out you are in your mission if you're at a point where you're starting to do interplanetary transfers you're going to be operating somewhere here which means your emphasis really is is on precision right if you have something that's really very powerful again it'll be wasteful and it will um, it will make that kind of insertion really hard to do because you're going to be accelerating so aggressively that your errors in your insertion burns are, are, are you're risking very high error values. Um, so uh, I would I would not recommend that you do that. But the Juno engine that we had. Um, it's got at 26 kilonewtons. It's for for a final stage. Is a very nice number to have. Um, so what I was thinking of is we could use the XLR 99s for a second stage engine, and then we could have a three stage variant where we add another stage using the the Juno. And the designs that I was looking at for that are what I just showed you. This would be kind of like the the overall configuration and if we're not utilizing that third stage um, that'll just basically give us additional fairing room or we can even reuse the same kind of fairings for when we've got the three stage configuration and it would just be a taller uh, a taller rocket um, this is where is it I think I cannot recall which engine was here. Um, does this guy have it? Uh, Vega stage two. <clears throat> yeah, so it's not. I don't know what this engine is. The GE four or five H. Um, I have no idea what this is. It's the the quoted performance is actually pretty good at 311 seconds that's actually surprisingly good um especially for an, like an early lox care lox engine um so the 405 h i'm actually not super familiar with i'm more familiar with the vega or not the vega with the uh the 6k um where where i'm hesitating in using the 6k would be for the second stage engine just because it's such a low thrust engine that uh, you know we won't uh, the point at which you stage um, your rocket like when your state when this staging happens typically right now on the Atlas Baker that staging happens when we're at about 65 to 70 kilometers Right, <clears throat> so there's still some amount of atmospheric drag, and and there's is a non-negligible amount of gravity. Atmospheres is, is fairly low at that point, um, which is why even the um, maneuvering thrusters are enough to give it uh, attitude authority. But uh, the the later the later you stage obviously the less this becomes an issue and the earlier you stage the more this becomes an issue um, and and looking at power the earlier your staging happens uh, the more you're going to need to have thrust to offset the effects of gravity right um, so that's one of the things to consider and that's why i'm sort of hesitant to use i don't think we can use the juno for a second stage but even if we stack them i mean i think we would probably need to stack at least four four would put us at about 120 kilonewtons 
no, it'd be like about a hundred. Four would put us at about a hundred, a hundred and five, a hundred and ten. Um, which is not bad. Uh, the Agena is half that, but it was a smaller and lighter upper stage. But it, again, it has limited performance. So I would like to have a, a modular design where the second stage we can use at all times. And then if we were doing something like flyby missions to Venus or Mars and we need extra bang for the buck, we could have that third stage, which would use that the Juno engine. And go on uh what is it four or five this is it oh that's the one that's it hmm what about this guy yeah so this would probably be a better choice that's true i had seen this guy before i forgot this would probably be a better choice than the xlr 99 what about the specs reliability and that kind of stuff the fact that this guy uses Carolox or Oxygen is not too problematic because if we're doing stuff like a uh, flyby missions to the outer planets or anything we're sending to the outer planets, um, the amount of Delta V we'd lose off of the second stage would be less of a problem because you would rely more so on the uh, the third stage, which you would use to do the, your, your insertion. And this guy is using storable propellants. So those will last for a very, very long time, right? As long as you have electrical power, you're good to go. So that's that's really a desirable feature. So having oxygen on the second stage is, is not really too much of a problem. Um, <clears throat> and 312 seconds is, is really good. We've got three ignitions, which again is, is quite nice. And we have gimbling, which which means we won't have to do any kind of a setup like this, which is, it works. But I mean, where I don't like this engine is I just, 90% ignition, that is just so bad. It's it's really, really very bad. Um, yeah. I'm not sure about that. So what we'll do is we'll get rid of this for now and we'll start seeing, we'll start building and see what we can come up with. I'm going to keep one of these guys for now, but I will probably not use this. Um, all this is going to go. The one thing I am not 100% sure that we will be able to achieve is that that shape that I, I'm hoping to go for. So I would like to do, I want to follow the same kind of profile where it's, the rocket is not tapering in. Um, <clears throat> I probably should not have Hold on, I shouldn't have gotten rid of the Atlas. And this is not the right version either. Um, <clears throat> in the Atlas Centaur that comes at a much later time, um, you see that, 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 you know, that classic shape where the top of the Atlas, on, on like Mercury Atlas, is tapering in at the top and it's got like a conical shaped tank. Um, you see this on the Atlas Agena as well. Um, for the second stage, I would like to have that change where we are maintaining the uh, diameter of uh, the Atlas and the lower half. So it's just like the Atlas Centaur, it's, it's got that constant cylindrical or diameter value, which is like 3.1 or 3.05 or something. Um, do you know, Ash, do you know the 405, <clears throat> what, what you need to get tech wise to get that, uh, the H variant of it with the better, better reliability? 
I could do some, some digging, but if you know off the top of your hand that uh, off the top of your head, that'd be nice. I'm just gonna re-add the atlas. Um, okay, so we're going to get rid of this for now. Um, yeah, we'll get rid of these so that they're not in the way. So what I want to do is that I want to do... So see, this would be where the second stage is, in here. And you can see it's it's maintaining the cross section, right? And, and then it starts to taper in for where you've got the third stage. I'm not sure that we'll use exactly <clears throat> this configuration uh, for it, but it could be, it could be interesting. So the part that we are going to get rid of is going to be this top cylindrical, or not cylindrical, but the um, this guy here, the the conical shaped one. And then what we'll have to do, I will most likely not delete this and just kind of keep it because if I get rid of this and stretch stretch this guy to compensate, I will also have to retool this guy which I don't want to do because that would probably be not cheap since it's a balloon tank um, so what we'll probably just do is we would do something like this where we've got three uh, three meters diameter and we'll just increase this guy to three on top Obviously, this we will have to adjust. I just need to see now. I have to remember how is this guy attached to anything? Yeah. So what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the detailing at the bottom to see what's connected to what. Because I'm going to need this guy to, how much is this going to set us back, tool? It's tooled? Huh. Odd. This guy is not going to stay. Do that. We'll grab this guy and put it on top of this guy. This guy will go. So I'm looking at, obviously this guy is not going to stop here. It's gonna go higher. Um, I don't know how high yet because we have to. <clears throat> I forgot to see how much fuel we had. How much, what was that at? Um, we were at 1.6 before. I want to see how much fuel this guy had on board so that we maintain the same fuel load. Because we're going to have to, by increasing the diameter, obviously we're increasing the internal volumes, volume, so we'll have to shrink it down back a bit. So we're carrying 77 units of locks in it. So if we switch or change its shape, we're gonna have to go back down. So it's from 7,700 length will shrink to another thousand.
not too much. So here, 1.8. It's it's a little more. I'd say from it was what 76 something to 78. So we've got about 200 more than what we had before, but 13.15 um, tons. I'm looking at the weight because you know rocket equation. The heavier this gets, the more time we waste fighting gravity. So we have to be careful about that. And that's one thing too is we'll have to be careful with that second stage is. Um, we don't want it to get so heavy that whatever gains we get from the upper stage we lose in the first stage because it's 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 having to push a, a heavier mass, right? One of the realities of, of design and engineering is um, everything is a trade-off. Everything is a trade-off. And the optimal design is the one that figures out how to get the best trade-off off of those parameters that you're 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 working with right so if we if we shrink it back down we're going from 13.15 so it's, it's three quarters of a ton which is not i mean in in a 150 ton vehicle three quarters of a ton is on the first stage is really not much but if we were to do something like this 77 and bring it to 1.8 meters uh, yeah well I think it'll be 1.8 the burn time will be a little longer but that that really should be fine so I'm gonna want this guy here to be at the top of this guy so what I now have to be careful with is this guy here and you'll see it better if I come down here but that is the root part for the rest of the detailing at the bottom that you're seeing here right and by root part i mean i mean exactly that is that everything else all of these that you see highlighted are connected to this one guy so if we stretch this guy it's going to move these components so we just have to go back and double check and see where its placement is and then we just have to slide it back into place. Now, the one thing I will do before I continue is <clears throat> I'm using, uh, this is balloon and I'm using a three by three by 1.8. I'm gonna switch this to an RO tank. I've got 7,800 liters of locks. And I'm gonna keep that in mind because I need this guy as well. This I will not need, but we're going to replace this with our O tanks because it's a little bit better, but we also have um, some design play that we can we can uh, fiddle around with in terms of you know what the top of the tank is like having a nice dome tank like that looks a lot better than having a flat, procedural part that has zero detailing and you know to it and and you know me I'm, I'm all about the detailing on it um, for this guy we really don't need this will not be visible right and we'll come back to you I want something plain for now just so that we're not biased in how we look at this guy on the outside and we'll come back to the detailing a little later on um, I just want to have my visuals. Yeah, so that is that that stage that Ash was talking about that has the 405 in it. That's the 405 right here. These circular tanks, I believe, were helium tanks for pressurization because I believe the 405 was pressure fed was it subject to, no if it's subject to ollage then it won't have been pressure fed yeah so in terms of the bottom, we kind of we could just go with a flat, a flat value. We'll put this guy. Why is it not grabbing it? 
Ah, this. We'll put this guy back on. We will also grab this guy and put him back on. And then we'll just put it into place to hide that. So we need to have 7,800 uh, units of locks right now. So we have multiple possibilities here, depending on, and if we pull up the Delta V readouts, Seven thousand is what we have. If we use the top one, seventy-one sixty, seventy-two. So this is a better ratio. The middle one and the bottom one is seven. So we're gonna go with the this guy here. So thirty-nine point three versus thirty-eight point three percent kerosene is giving us the higher delta V which is what we want. So for us to have uh, that amount of locks that we had initially, this to me is probably the shape that makes the most amount of sense for where the this portion of the tank should be because um, you would have some sort of an interstage resting on this portion here so it only makes sense that the dome part of the tank would be slightly recessed to that interstage so this to me is what makes the most amount of sense and if we push it up to 1.8 This is giving us currently, why is it such a small amount of fuel? That's bizarre. Hmm, it's odd. A small amount of fuel inside. Well, utilization is at a hundred, so that's not that's really not the issue. What about this guy? How is this affecting us? We've got forty four. So this one has more fuel inside. I don't know why it's got that gray, gray uh, piece to it. No, no, no. I think then we're going to start getting into some weird stuff that we don't really care for. Yeah, so this is all going to get into stuff that we don't want. Um, oh, this is a wrong one. Yeah, so this seems to be like it would give us the biggest or the best bang for buck in terms of uh, the amount of fuel that we've carry inside yes yeah, the amount the reason why the amount of fuel is is kind of low is is because the tank is recessed inside um, the dome is coming in flush so you've got you can imagine you've got the dome like this so you've got a lot of wasted space 
all around that's that's why you're having to increase the height so if we bring it up to three we're still kind of low so we'll put this guy back on actually even yeah I don't I don't I don't want to play tool tank tooled 7,000 funds is not bad. It's not great. <clears throat> the thing is, if I... if I See, this guy's got... Um, this was me not being familiar enough with RO tanks, but this guy's got the wrong top of the tank because it's domed, and so we're, we're having to, to play with the height more than we ought to have um, in order to, to have the right values. I'm going to just remove the fuel here. Because I want to see what the overall amount of kerosene we've got on board is once we have the correct values. This is obviously way too high, so we're going to bring it down. I don't know why it responds so slowly every time you just tweak the length. At what point is it easier to just make the same amount with old procedural tanks? Uh, it's big on dome and the tankage. Um, Man, this guy is taking his time. Um, no, I am reading chat. I'm just, I'm not, um, I'm not looking at it as, as often as I should be. Uh, using a mountain in a tank that's in the middle on the top of your first is not something that should be a thing. No, you're not. You're not wrong. Um, if I was, if I was going to do this more correctly, um, I would make this one one tank. The only reason why I'm not, I'm trying to avoid doing that is um, if we remove the top tank that's not highlighted, we will have to stretch this guy and. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about it right now, and if we will either have to tool this guy or retool this guy, which will come out really to the same. So that's really not. Yeah, I guess I'll just make it the one tank because it kind of doesn't make sense to have that on top. I was trying to figure out how to how to not how to limit tooling is what I was trying to figure out. So I'm just going to get the right amount of fuel in here, and then we will be able to see what the total amount of Carolox or kerosene we have on board is. So we should have, and yeah, and that number rings a bell. We should have about 52.5 kiloliters, so 52,500 liters of uh, kerosene to get the total amount of burn time that we uh, normally have. So what I'll do is I'm just going to remove this guy for now, and then this guy we will not need to have. We're going to need a fairing that we can use uh, to produce the interstage. So we're going to go with interstage fairing. It's going to go down to that. So we're obviously, <clears throat> we're low on, on kerosene, so I'm going to have to stretch this guy by some amount.
it won't offset the detailing too much just because I uh, rooted all the detailing on this tank here because I knew that when we were going to stretch it it would probably just be stretched by this guy but um, I will probably stretch this guy at some point as well for now just to kind of keep give it a nice ratio but that that's going to offset a lot of the detailing so I'll I don't want to bore you guys with that I want to get into the actual upper stage design because that's that's what we said we were going to do but I just need to get a bit of an idea here just for the numbers on the bottom stage but once we've got that done can we So I had an idea. Um, there's two things that we can do, and I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are. Um, we can, if we go back to this, uh, the second stage was kind of, um, it was one sort of like big, kind of stretched circular tank that was in, that was squeezed in between the uh, the bottom inner stage. And then the top end of stage, it's, it's got this, this kind of weird sort of like X-shaped configuration. And that allows them to keep the same diameter, which is probably what... Probably what we'll do. I'm not necessarily trying to do like an exact replica of this. Um, I think where our design will probably be very different is going to be this guy here. I'm not necessarily a fan of how they've got uh, this thing very needle nosed near the top and have the Vega stage like this. And the reason why I'm not a huge fan is because it gives you a very small payload fairing to work with so I'm not a fan of that I would rather maintain yeah I've got I've, I know what I'm talking about in my own my own mind I'm not sure how well I'm, I'm translating that but um, I'm debating how we can go about which of these two is the one Thirty-nine. Yes, this guy. So if we're doing the second stage, we can maybe do Yeah, I think this is probably <clears throat> I think this is probably going to be the better engine, but I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I mean, this guy's got better specific impulse, and it's got half the weight of the XLR99 because that's kind of a lot of dead weight. If you factor in, if you factor in the the LR99's um, lower specific impulse, which is lower by what 24, 36 seconds, um, it's not a huge jump, but it's not inconsequential, and you've also got half the weight. So fact, like the dry, actual you know dry mechanical mass of the engine on the 405. So having the 405 engine is probably going to be the better better design choice because you've got less dead weight on the engine, and the higher specific impulse means you've got the delta V you need using less fuel. So that's got a rather significant effect on 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 what we're doing. 
Um, engine wise, no, not this guy. We're gonna need 42 grand, which is not a cheap, and another 25 grand. So 67,000. We've got the budget and we have room in terms of contracts. So we will be able to do something with that as well. Um, we're coming up on the two hour mark. Um, does anybody need a bathroom break? <laughs> I'm not sure how often people will ask you that question on a stream. But does anybody need a bathroom break? It would be like a, maybe like a two minute thing or something. I'm looking at the chat to see if people are gonna wanna pause for like a minute or two or three or four or whatever. Like a really short break just to kind of maybe get something to drink, get something to eat. Um, I want to get fairly. I, I want to get. I want to get far ahead on this, on this one here. Yeah, nineteen saying use that my third stage restroom stretched legs wouldn't be a miss. Okay, so let's do that. I'll just I'll just keep the stream open. Um, I'll mute my mic. I will be back in two or three minutes, and I'll let you guys do that as well. And then once you guys come back, you can just kind of type it in the chat and say you're back or good to go or whatever. I don't want to make I want to make sure that we don't we don't lose anybody when uh, when we come back. So see you guys in five.
All right. <clears throat> I'm back. Are you guys back? Just going to wait to see. Going to wait 20 seconds to see what kind of response I get in the chat to see if people are back. All right. Um, <clears throat> what kind of shape can we get? I want to see what kind of shape we can get with uh, RO tanks real quick. I want I want the dome structure at the bottom where the engine attaches something like that <clears throat> but I don't necessarily want to have hmm, what if we I mean, that does not look great. Let's see what we have. Yeah, see, we've got... Hmm. So our rated burn time off of this guy is what? Currently. Four and a half minutes. Four and a half minutes. which means that we need and this is the ratio we're looking for four and a half is it four and a half four minutes and five seconds so four minutes is going to be 245 seconds is what we're looking at if we make this guy three meters It's obviously way too big. <clears throat> okay. So we'll shrink this a bit and we'll 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 make it slightly elongated because we'll have um Hmm. I'm going to want. So let's just let's give this guy the shape we needed to have first, and then that'll help us visually to get a better idea of what what direction we could go with the the the, the tank shape. If we just do that, I 
combining a spherical with a toroidal tank. I don't know that you could use, you could set the nose and mount a modular tank to dome. Yeah, it's, um, I do have something like that kind of in mind. Um, if we look at possible shapes that we could use for this guy. I know there's quite a lot of variations, which is kind of awesome, but at the same time, um, not always easy to pick. See, if we did something like that, the <laughs> what if we do that and then we dome the bottom as well? Um, something like this could be a good idea, but this would be too, if there was a way to manipulate the width of the diameter here, I could, I would probably be tempted to go with that. So you can get it larger, but you, because what I, what I don't want is just put this guy here. What I don't want to have is something where <clears throat> the do that will shrink the uh, the fairing as well because we, we don't need it to be so big or tall. So see, this is kind of like what I don't want to have is like it looks like the engine is too small for, for the tank, right? <clears throat> so we are supposed to be at, I think this is the right number. We're supposed to be at it's 400, 4 minutes and 5 seconds, so 245 seconds, so this is exactly bang on. But, I want to see some here, something here real quick, which is, because there's something on the real design that I actually find that's kind of hot, and you'll see what I mean. Uh, integral is a better one, yeah, integral, radial. I'll put this guy at... Um, does this guy need to be pressure fed? I don't think. Subject to homage. <clears throat> this is not pressure fed, so we don't need to have this guy high pressured. Um, <clears throat> we'll put silver and. Let's see what we get out of six. Now we'll have to rotate the engine because I could just switch the way I put my tanks, but kind of want to do this like this for the moment.
So for the sake of aesthetic, aesthetic pleasantness, we'll put something like this, and we will also. Um, and now I'm 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 trying to I'm basically kind of like um, factoring in the location of. I guess you could call this guy a vernier. Um, this would probably be, I don't know why it's not moving. There we go. Okay. This would probably be the uh, um, turbo pump exhaust and they would use this in some cases um, as the uh, roll control. So by having this guy actuated, you could also use it as a roll control. It would it would offset some of the thrust a bit, but it it, it would be workable. <clears throat> Something else too that um, I don't know if you guys are are familiar um, with, but uh, you can actually. Uh, so you you've got the uh, the snap right. So you can you can have it either loose like this where it's, where it's, it's free moving and you can do like really fine tuning with it but you can you can snap it obviously and then you'll get fixed increments right if you hold down shift while you drag you have the size of the steps versus if you don't hold on shift right I don't know how many people know this probably a lot but just in case you guys didn't um, that's something that I've I've I use excessively like I'm I'm always using the half step I'm always 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 using the half step when I um, when I use the uh, the snap function just because it's 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 really useful to get good symmetrical um, placement of items when you're doing builds now <clears throat> there's a couple things we can do in in actuality these would have been used most likely for helium to keep the tank pressurized that to me it's something that unfortunately is not modeled in ro or with real engines and it's something that i really i suggested it at one point i forget to who but i i, I had suggested it at one point where it would be nice to have that function where if your engine is pressure fed um, you need to include helium tanks to, to maintain proper pressure. Uh, it would be an added dimension I think would, 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 would be interesting to have, in my opinion. But in here, we don't actually have to do that. So if we look at the actual design, you had something like this. And... These were probably helium tanks, but what I'm going to do to make this kind of useful is, I just had an idea. I'm going to reduce this to two. I'm going to fill it up with this. And KSP is getting kind of laggy. I'm not sure if it's just a stream weighing it down, but that's all right. So this is a little too close, obviously. Um, it's got the right, maybe not the right height, probably. I don't want it at this height because that's... Um, so this could actually be... <clears throat> 
What am I using for video editing? I use DaVinci Resolve. It's really awesome. I use the free version because I don't I don't currently have a budget of 400 US bucks that I can spend for the upgraded pro version. And honestly, what you get out of the free free version is really very powerful and you can do quite a lot with it. So um, I would highly recommend using that. I know that Felix Yu, um, he's also been making some, some, some pretty sweet content. He uses, I, I forget what the Adobe one is, but um, he's using Adobe, and but he's he had previous experience doing that. I started doing video editing when I started doing the channel, and I and I, I started using Resolve just because when I did my research, I was kind of the one that most people were pointing to. So that's the one I would highly recommend um, if you wanted to get into that, and it's fairly easy to learn. Um, <clears throat> If we bring these out, I want to see also what kind of some of the stuff that I like to, to, to check also when I'm, when I'm doing design is again, I, I don't want to be I, I hate getting hacky with um, clipping and that kind of stuff. If we pull these guys out, we're actually good in terms of we're not colliding with the interstage fairing. So this is obviously you would you would not want to do that in real life um, if we rotate back so that we can adjust the other tank we'll see what kind of placement we get out of, out of that but I think this is too I guess we'll shrink the size down to 600 That would be better. <clears throat> Just gonna bring this guy down a bit. So just so that we see what we're doing and what we're working with. But adding tanks like this at the aft portion of a stage, I find goes a long way into um, improving again the aesthetics of the design and the realism of the appearance of the design which so it's something that i've adobe premiere yeah that's the one it's something that i i absolutely love doing because it really 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 makes a difference <clears throat> and i also always allow myself some inspiration from the real thing now the one problem that i'm I've got, I find with I would like these tanks to be in more. Hmm. We'll put the other two here and we'll see where that's, that gets us. So I want to see Because if they're too far out, it, it just it doesn't look good. It doesn't look right. <clears throat> and we'll relocate these guys as well. So that is not bad. I just find that this base is
too wide on the bottom. And it's kind of annoying me. I want to see what else we can we can do. Nope, that is not what I want to do. That should be silver. I guess it's this guy. Now we will probably have to shrink it. It's not uh, bad. And what I would do is I am going to need some all edge capabilities, but I won't need much. So I can shrink these guys down to something like that. These will have to be high pressure and will most likely be high test peroxide. do something like that that would be <clears throat> see this kind of configuration would be a logical spacing between the tanks and this guy you, you obviously would not want to have tanks of anything close to rocket exhaust because you're gonna have a bad day doing that <clears throat> but I'm gonna put this aside for now We'll keep that one as a backup because I want to see just in terms of the bottom part here, what, what else, what other options we've got that we can use. This is just color. That's texture. Okay, so we don't care about that for now. And that's wrong. This is actually... Hmm... I like the truss section that we've got on this guy. Like I, I, I enjoy seeing that truss um, structure visible. I think that's kind of nice. It's kind of appealing. Yeah, having some RCS for, for attitude control is going to be an absolute must. Yeah, that 100% that will be happening. So this could potentially be... What I like about this is, is um, it's tapering in more. And I don't dislike that. And we can do something like that where we'll just bring these guys up. So as not to have them in an awkward floating position. Could we bring these guys in? See, by having the half step instead of like the full step, it's a, it's a really, really nice balance to have. It allows for slightly better stuff. And this, what's fun about using the, the snap mode, especially with the half step, the half step is um, you can always guarantee a proper placement of where your items are going to be. So we've got some interference here, so we'll see if we if we were going to um, fill this guy with high test peroxide. That's 45, so we'd have 90 units of high test, which is a lot. Certainly a lot more than we need, so we can shrink these guys down because we won't need. That would be 62. Um, in the Atlas Baker, or the Baker of a stage, I had eight per cylindrical tank for a total of 24 um so here just the one is already exceeding that amount so we don't need to have that much this is going to be a heavier this is going to be a heavier stage so we are going to need we are going to need more but what am i running pc wise um 
my graphics card is a 1070 overclock factory overclocked card nvidia my processor is an i5 and i i am trying to remember what gen it is i will not be able to remember what generation i have i've had that processor for maybe about three years ish so that you should be able to kind of double back and figure out what the generation is off of that so something this is not bad it's not great I don't dislike it I don't love it I'm just trying to see what else we can I don't need this guy anymore <clears throat> see I always enjoy looking at the real stuff just to kind of get an idea and an appreciation for how the designs were were were, were done in real life it can be really useful to kind of shape your mind and and um, things you ought to take into consideration if you're trying to make more clever realistic appealing designs um, some of the stuff I'm looking for here is I think you can see it better in in this one here but you can see that and it's probably because of the uh, turbo pump exhaust but this tank here definitely seems like it's smaller in diameter than these other tanks here right so that's something that's interesting. I like this pipe here where I will probably reutilize some of the existing piping on a lower half to model something like this. I don't dislike this at all. And you can see that it's kind of feeding into the turbo pump area. So that's kind of nice. So <clears throat> out of curiosity, where is everybody currently watching from? I am located in um, in Montreal, Canada. Let's see what else we got option wise. So that's like a flatter version. Lansing, Michigan, Portland, Oregon. Is Oregon Eastern time or is it more central time? Oh wow, Australia, huh? Well, so it's it's early Saturday morning now for you. Thanks for joining in, man. The pictures I got, um, honestly, it's just from Google searching, and you'll get. You, you look at the picture, but you can also go to the site itself to see what the source is. And a lot of times, if it's a dedicated source to rocketry and that kind of stuff, like NASA Spaceflight, for example, uh, they'll give you a lot of additional pictures that you can kind of dig. Um, sometimes I'll go into archives and I'll work with that. Like when, um, I, this was something I talked about last time, but when I was researching the... Um, the Atlas Center, like all of these pictures, like pictures like this here, um, this is something I found in an archive. Like I must have spent, I don't know, it was like a Saturday night or Friday night, and I must have spent like an hour or two 
and I glossed over probably about 400 pictures just looking for a bunch of pictures and I was I was looking for some specific detailing like this kind of stuff here is amazing to me um, <clears throat> and these are all pictures that I found off of it's the United States Air Force Museum in, or it's like the San Diego Air Force Museum or the National Air and Space Museum in San Diego something like that <clears throat> but they um, I guess they, they they've, they've got like a rich history with Convair who made the Atlas so they've got some really they've, they've got archives with thousands of pictures of early 1960s Convair Atlas balloon tanks the Mercury Atlas and that kind of stuff so it's really interesting interesting kind of stuff um, so yeah Well, people are from the Netherlands and from Germany. Well, well, so we've got people from from kind of all over the place. That's actually kind of kind of neat. So welcome, 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 every everybody. Yeah. So I I find these pictures kind of all over the place just from um, just from digging one source after another. So let's see, this is, we'll get rid of melt texture, silver. This is interesting. We'd have to bring these guys down. So the one problem here is this guy would have to go up and in like that. And <clears throat> hmm. See, the location of this guy is kind of fixed just because we have to be careful not to get any kind of clipping. Can we maybe get something in between these two? Don't laugh. Yeah, this looks kind of weird. I mean, if this wasn't flat, it would be more interesting. If it could, get, if we could have like a rounded shape or something, that could be a lot more interesting. This is way too long. Hmm. I'm trying to see what the different layers of coloring do. Not much.
Yeah, I'm not. <clears throat> I'm not a hundred percent keen on. Um, I don't dislike this. This is not bad. Let's see what we get if we. No. Nope. Let's just see real quick if we can. Now, some of these are absolutely huge. Well. This is getting into Soyuz. And then this is the no stuff, so. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I like this guy, <clears throat> but. Yeah, I think this is going to be it. So, what I'll do is I'll, I'll get this guy back on. The one thing I'm not a fan of with this version is it won't leave a lot of room for kind of detailing. I mean, in a way, like it's already been built in. But, um, see if we wanted to kind of, um, if we wanted to maybe use inspiration from the real thing, um, we could look at something like this where you've got that piping on the back or on the side, and we could use procedural wings to kind of replicate the tank, the tank, some of the tank mounts. But by having that truss already in place and existing, it's kind of getting in the way of us potentially being able to do that. But at the same time, um, I want to see what we could maybe get out of it. I'm just going to save that for now. This guy will not be decoupling. Um, what can we get? <laughs> Bay Area while at work, fantastic. <laughs> I hope I am improving your working experience. So, so we could maybe do something like this. Um, Hold on, hold on.
We won't need this guy to snake like that, so we can unkink it and maybe just reconnect it. We could probably, in fact, just use this and get rid of that part. Atlas Wise, Atlas Wasp. Where are you getting the names? I think Kepler could be, in my mind, would probably be the most interesting one of the lot. I'm doing this a little quickly just to kind of um, <clears throat> not make things a little too slow. Yeah, <clears throat> that makes sense. This we can fine tune at a later point, but I kind of want to get a general idea of what we would have to work with. Um, <clears throat> at this point, what I would be hmm. what I'm tempted to look at right now is what we can do in terms of the RCS that we'll need. What I've been doing for some time now, which is a lot of fun, is <clears throat> don't grab the all moving parts. But you grab the non-moving and it doesn't really matter if it's supersonic or not um, that's really more a question of of heat tolerances but you really kind of don't care about that when you're doing what you're going to what i'm going to be doing now um, so i remove all of the uh, edge values and then i bring this guy down i know i'm not going to need a lot of this and what i'm basically doing is um, i really like the the internal rcs mod i use that quite a lot so I'm basically creating a what will be the RCS mount basically for for the stage where they would be located so I'm just trying to get a nice value and that's way too thick so we'll bring that down a bit If you're using the um, <clears throat> if you're using the procedural wings like that, um, if you right if you left mouse button on some of them, you'll get the same value if you if you uh, right click. 
but on some of them you will get noticeably different values if you right click than if you left click so it's kind of like a fine-tuning capability so the smallest increments are always on the left click a reason why my audio is cutting um, I'm I hit the mute button every now and then um, just when I'm I'm taking a piece of food because I don't want to bother you guys with that but there really shouldn't be any other reason why the audio is and the audio should not be cutting at all so I'm not sure if that's what's causing issues at all so let's see what we can get in terms of placement for RCS So these are going to be really important for um, any kind of, of orienting of the craft once we're in orbit. So this guy's fine. And what I like about internal RCS is uh, you can really recess these and it'll give you like a really nice finish. Yeah, I'm not going to leave this tank floating per se. I'm going to um, uh, probably model some sort of... of if if we end up going with this version, I will I will use um, procedural parts to to mimic some sort of mount, it's not necessarily unlike what you see something like this here on either side, because it it, it looks ridiculous if it's just floating there out of place. It, it that doesn't work. Um, but very quickly. I'm just kind of curious what which of the two, the upper one or the lower one, is more appealing to you guys. I mean, different. This one definitely has got some some bang for buck. I kind of just wish I could tweak the the diameter of the truss on it. That's the one thing I would make it narrower. That's the one thing that's kind of bothering me. It's not a huge upset, but I would kind of appreciate that. But I'm curious of the two, which which of the two you guys kind of prefer. So the fun thing is that with this rocket, what we're going to be able to do is we'll be able to have... <clears throat> we'll be able to have... Um, an option of a two stage or a three stage and the three stage version would really be used for um, all of the kind of interplanetary stuff where, where wherever we need to do some sort of fine tuning insertion or that kind of stuff we would use the the three stage version because that upper stage using the uh, the vega engine uh, that they yeah that's what that's what it's called is going to really go a long way in in helping us have precise insertions because it's got really great specific impulse restartability and the thrust is not too too high.
So that's going to be really interesting. So some people like the the top one. Most seem to be liking the 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 bottom one. And and I mean uh, this is not finished, so it's looking a little naked. And I think that's kind of maybe skewing some of the results in favor of this one. I mean, don't get me wrong. This one looks really good. I am going to continue to play around with this some and and i won't do all the super f f like detailed detailing on the stream because it's it can get kind of long i mean unless you guys like to see that but i mean fine fine tuning pipe positioning to get a certain look in my opinion is is i don't think that, that that's necessarily the most captivating thing to be seeing on a stream but i mean at the same time if the demand is there i i, I have no objections to it yeah um, and i think i'm kind of inclined to agree with your point Nivens. So typically what I do here is, oh, I always get these wrong. Um, let's do that. <clears throat> this is typically the go-to configuration for RCS placement on a lower stage. And the reason why, oops, I don't know why I bounced up, bounced back. A little lower. The game is getting really clumsy. I kind of wish <laughs> that wasn't a thing with KSP. Um, <clears throat> so this kind of, of, of placement on the RCS is uh, pretty go-to. And the reason why is um, you can set these guys, uh, the ones that are, 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 are firing in plane on the screen. Um, so in plane would be like if your screen is like a piece of paper and these guys are firing parallel to that this guy would be firing out of plane so like towards you um <clears throat> is that all of these all three of these will handle pitch yaw and roll right so i'm not sure in the vab actually which what is, i think yaw would probably be side to side and then uh yeah and then pitch would be like this and then yaw would be like that but by having this kind of configuration is these guys will handle uh, yaw as well as handling roll. And then these guys would handle pitch. And then that way you get full authority uh, just by this kind of configuration. And then you can, you can subsequently also add another set. And then these guys here will be the ones you use on Ollage. And you would place them kind of like that. So you could do something like this. We'll have to fine tune the placement. And then of course, using advanced tweakables, we will set these guys so that they strictly do fore and aft and they do nothing else. And we can kind of fine tune this or it looks, I kind of like these guys being exposed a little bit um, like that.
so this that has typically been obviously I would I would fix this a bit <clears throat> And then we'll bring this guy down because we really don't need it to be strong. It's not going to be exposed to any kind of airstream, so it doesn't need to really be strong. And then by making it lighter, with it's it's to our advantage, right? Um. So you, we would have something to that effect. Um. So we've got all this taken care of. We can. Rotate it. What we would need at this point would be an avionics module. And one thing that I've been meaning to try and do is we're going to use procedural module. Uh, well, sorry, stuttered there. Procedural avionics. Um, I'm just going to get the color to be slightly different for the moment so that we've got a good idea of what we're looking at but i'm going to use i'm going to try something that i think should work i'm going to go with polygon and do something like this we're going to have to set it up to we won't do deep space with this um, uh, even the third stage would never require deep space capabilities because it'll never it, it won't ever really be used beyond geostationary altitudes which why are the why are they uneven um the reason i put them kind of uneven like that is if you look at quad rcs Yeah, see, you can actually, oh, this is good. Um, you can actually see these guys are offset, right? So this is really nice and large pitch, but you can see that these guys are offset. And the reason is that if you imagine the piping inside, if these were, because of how narrow this portion is, right? If these guys were at the same height, that piping would kind of, the piping from this guy would, would tend to want to collide with the piping of this guy because it would be a really very tight amount of spacing. So by having them offset, you can imagine that this, the piping could go in here and then this piping could go in there and then you've got more room. These guys, the upper and, and lower ones, is less of an issue because uh, they're further apart so you don't have that spacing constraint. But these guys here you do so the tendency there will, will will be to offset them like that and so you can see it again here much better in fact um, so here you can re so these guys are in the same line but these guys are offset a bit so i've i like to you know, again it's a, it's a small small amount of detail that uh, bit by bit adds to to the aesthetic to the looks so this is not necessarily going to be the final configuration or look or whatnot of the design, but it's easier to it's easier to, to, to build something if you've got something to work with, right? Like if you don't know where you're going and if you don't know what to do, then the thing you should be doing is build something, start playing around with something because then it gives you a much clearer and more tangible idea of where you you are at versus where you want to go and then what you need to do in between. Yeah, so the third stage will have potentially deep space avionics on it. Um, <clears throat> the probe itself that you would fire out, obviously that one would have deep space avionics, but the third stage is going to get you out of Leo at which point you kind of get rid of it so I, I don't know that we you would, you would need deep space avionics on it um, but we're having deep space can be really very useful and probably what why I'll be using it is 
um, shutting down the avionics on it is super useful in, in saving the amount of battery power that you've got. So that's certainly very, 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 very important. Um, so I was doing this, uh, controllable mass, how, 13, so this would probably be, God, you could probably go with 16 tons. I want to see something here. We can currently handle 154, but if we multiply these, I'm going to have to set it up to something first. This guy, let's set it up for now just to five tons. So we're at 158.9. And if we put, say, three, do we get a jump of 15? Yep. And the reason why <clears throat> I'm looking at doing that is I'm thinking about so we'll have to shrink these guys down and these guys could be three tons a piece energy wise we won't need that much Even this. So I'm going to bring it down to two, actually. And we're going to continue to shrink these guys. Can we do 1.5? Hmm. This is still kind of big. It's a lot bigger than I would like it to be. This is obviously not going to be exactly how I would put these guys, but um, what I'm what I'm I'm hinting at is I'll show you the picture that I'm kind of working on. Yeah, that's exactly it. As a lot of times you'll have this is not unique to this stage, like the centaur has this as well, but <clears throat> this is actually the top of the of, of that tank. And you can see you've got all of the units on top like this right and kind of like the piping at the lower bottom of the stage adds to the look and realism of the design i've often found also that the having avionics like square module for avionics on the top also gives that feel um, you can also see that on which is it the Centaur T? So you can see it here, you've got all the avionics modules in blocks like this at the top, which I think is kind of neat. It, it, it adds to the look and to the feel, and I, um, I don't dislike that. So this is what the Centaur T looks like. Um, you can see at the top you've got some, some of those boxes. This was the centaur that was used on the Titan IV. I'm trying to see if I've got a better picture. Don't think I do, but anyways. So again, that's the kind of stuff you can also sort of have fun with, but um, the only problem here is that... What if I put this at zero? What if I put this at one? Let's go 100. So 
So this is the smallest we can kind of go, really. Yeah, that's exactly it. You you pick your diameter and tell it to set the avionics for controllable mass. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, the only problem is that <clears throat> basic avionics doesn't allow you to go small enough. So... Because hmm. alternatively, if we don't have this, may or may not work. I might do something differently. Because even if, even by trying to put these as small as as possible, is still giving us stuff that's way 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 too big so it's not going to want to lend itself to what we're trying to do but we could maybe get away by using procedural wings instead so we'll put this guy back to a cylinder and we will make it the same diameter as the top of the dome And then we'll be able to shrink the height as need be. So we'll probably need something like, I'm going to estimate about, our fuel tank here is 13 tons. So we'll probably need, if we factor in the, the upper stage, which would also have its own avionics unit, Maybe 16 tons ish should be about right. I just want to see if we can get there. Yeah, I had guessed 16. So we're at 16 tons and we're at 88% utilization. So we can we can shrink this guy a bit. We don't need it to be so tall. We'll put it at 265 to get a nice and round number. It's getting there. can have fun with this um, so we'll bring this guy back to that to zero we don't need this guy to be so tall but we do want it to be oops wrong one about square yeah something like that And we can do kind of something like this.
kind of a lot. I, th I know you can put fuel in these because they are wings. Um, <clears throat> again, I would, f I would fine tune this right now. I'm kind of just, I'm showing you guys the idea of how you can sort of play around with this, with this, um, and what you can do using something like procedural wings. Um, normally when I'm in the process of doing something like this, I will spend quite a lot of time, uh, retouching the positioning and until I'm very happy with it and and typically I'll I'll get the design fairly finalized and then I'll put it away for a little bit and come back on another day when my mind has kind of forgotten about it and and then usually when you come back to something after having putting it down for a while you have a much different approach and perspective to it and then you can really solidify the design at the end of that um, I just want to see real quick if we open the uh, the tank GUI, what we can put in there. Can we put, I don't think we can put anything with fuel. We cannot put battery power, I don't think. Yeah, we cannot, which is a shame. If we put fuselage, can we, I don't think you can. I would like to get electrical because then we could have these act as, oh, there we go, electric charge. How much? Yeah, that's all right. This we don't need very high utilization. What do we got? Yeah, see, now you can kind of make these really kind of nice looking batteries on top and you can you can fool around with the coloring and, and change the color to get something that looks better. Let's see what we can get with stock dark gray. That looks pretty decent, I think. Um, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you can kind of you can try different combinations to see, but um, again, not necessarily going to finalize that here, but if we were to use this, um, you end up having a f decently light battery. Um, we've got 8,000 units of charge per, and the wet mass is less than a kilogram. I don't think that this has been properly balanced because typically if you wanted to, I have no idea to be honest, I'm, I'm guesstimating here, but if you, if you wanted to um, use procedural tanks for that, quick question, what pack gives you those RCS thrusters you need? Yeah, th these guys, these are, are the ones you're talking about. These are internal RCS. So you can see it internal attitude jet. So the mod is called internal RCS. And honestly, like since I've, I've discovered it a while back, I've, I've never stopped using it. So about these batteries, because um, typically if you wanted to create, which you can, you can create your own custom batteries, but um, you have to use service module to do that. If I recall correctly, I don't think you can do that with other types of tanks. Unless I'm wrong. Yeah. See, there's no... Yeah, there's no electrical... You can put lead ballast for some reason, but you, you can put a bunch of types of fuels, understandably. But you cannot... You cannot put electrical charge. 
and even put like obviously putting a high pressure changes absolutely nothing right but if you the game is really starting to stutter <laughs> i think we're going to go for about another another 15 and about another 15 minutes um and then that's going to be about the two and a half hour mark thank you for the compliment yeah i uh, i it's it means a lot when people enjoy the design that's designs that's one of the things that kind of i enjoy one of the reasons i enjoy putting up good designs um i kind of wish i could have gotten this thing a little further along to be honest with you guys um like i said i i had meant to have I had meant that to have been more prepared for this so that there would have been a little less thinking out loud and more kind of just doing to, sh to, to have a more advanced design at this point um, because I wanted to show you guys some of the detailing. Um, what I'm, I might do is I'll record myself finishing the design and I'll kind of just produce an addendum video to this that would be slightly sped up so that you guys with like music on it or something and then you guys can actually see the finalized designing of it and so if you're interested in that part of it we can you'll be able to, to witness it and to see it and stop it whenever you feel like it um it's just that again like i said i typically really put in a lot of that when i'm designing something like this where like i'll be using the rocket again and again and again and again um i want it to look mint like i want it to look great right so i put in a lot of time and just fine-tuning and depending on the kind of viewer, viewer you are you may or may not enjoy four hours of fine-tuning detailing and that kind of stuff um so I would, but I could record it and then speed up the footage a bit, put some music on it, and then you guys can can watch it and and cut to whatever parts you want to see, or whatever. How does that sound? Yeah. So see in the um, service module here, you can put electric charge, right? So if we if we fill it up. If we max it, it'll go. We'll make it square. And then I'm going to shrink it until I get That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, we could al always just kind of schedule another stream for tomorrow or Sunday or something where we kind of go through this and, and finish the design. Build videos are tight. Yeah, you know what? Um, Karnas has been doing some of those um, where he's done like just pure build videos. And I had actually been debating whether or not i was going to do those so you know you, you, obviously like the, the main portion of the channel is the videos for the series and we're going through the career and we're progressing and that's going to go on for for quite a long time god willing um and then next to that and in tandem to that you have the trailer playlist which is kind of like well as per, per the title, it's, it's a trailer of every upcoming episode, right? Um, and then there's the new playlist, which is for this guy, for the live stream ones. And if I was going to do just pure build videos, I was debating where those would logically fit in. I think it, it would make most sense to fit them in their own category playlist which would be build videos episode one build videos episode two and that kind of stuff in my mind that gives you guys the most flexibility and consequently the best experience because then you can kind of go and pick and choose to do what you want right where the series the career is 
that's the piece de resistance. That's the main thing. But then if you like the teasers, you can also see those and they've got their own separate playlist. You can binge through those. You can go through the live streams one by one and you could also go through the build videos as well if you like doing those. I would probably... I don't know that I would do any voiceover for the build videos um, because it adds to the editing time in that case. But I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there's various formats I, I, in, in ways in which I could I could approach that. But if you guys dig build videos, then it's definitely something that we could we could add to the channel. Um, the only reason I haven't done it, to be completely honest with you, is I actually <clears throat> I actually really wasn't sure if people would care to watch build videos, just because my builds can be really long works in progress. Like I know that when I did all of this. Um, this was probably a good 20 hours at least. Yeah, probably like 15 to 20 hours worth of work of trying different stuff and then a lot of time studying the design. That's the thing too. Like obviously all, all the studying of the designs is something I would not bother putting in the video because I can't get you guys into my mind or something. And I don't know. There's, there's, there's different ways I could approach it. Um, but if you guys let me know that it's something you are interested in, then again, my my desire and my goal is for you guys to have a good time with the channel, a good experience. So um, if there's a market, then I will I will gladly cater to it. So I just want to compare. We're looking at about eight thousand units of of juice and if we play around with this guy until we get 8,000 this is still 108,000 50,000 still so might they might actually be 24,000 13 getting there I just want to see if the dry masses compare when they are equally filled this is 6,000, so we'll, we'll bump it up a bit. 78, I mean, that's pretty close. Um, dry mass for this guy always is a problem if we, if we put this real low. Wet is 350 grams. And these guys are 36 kilograms. Yeah, see there's a huge difference between the service module tank and these guys. And we actually have kind of similar utilization if we are at the 50% mark. Um, mid court sweep, that's an aerodynamic profile thing. It's not dry mass related. Yeah, even if we max this out, we're still nowhere. Like we're still. Yeah, so I'm I'm not sure what's up, uh, why there is such a. A huge difference between you know we're we're very very, close to having the same electrical power here. Um, if we do that, we'll probably be just about the same. Yeah, the game is starting to get really unresponsive. Hmm. I cannot, I cannot um, further increase it, the tank type, to a higher value. And that is one of the reasons why this is, is, is as high, because this is service module level one. 
I am currently researching, I believe, that level or in the process of because this is what's currently being researched. Um, I have 20.2 science points that I can use. Yeah, I could do that. <clears throat> Beauty takes time, it does. Okay, see, one of the things that I, um, I'm, I'm reading Ivan Verano, Ivan, Ivan Verano's comment where he says, my personal experience has been one. I watched the career series to ask myself how to do that in KSP three watch stream and learn tons um one of my hesitations for why i didn't initially started live streaming until kind of recently is just because of how long i put into doing some stuff because i can get really very picky um in how i want something to look spend quite a lot of time going back and forth into real designs and just kind of um, letting the ideas in my mind and the images in my mind simmer putting it down coming back again a few hours later on another day that kind of stuff and it can be a very drawn out and involved process at times um, a lot of times it will be that and i was afraid that if i was going to start streaming builds um it it would get very kind of dry and boring and that people might lose interest in in either the streaming and or the channel per se um so i was slightly hesitant to that and i'm just i'm honestly not sure what kind of response pure build streaming gets the advantage with having a video is you can edit out all the dead zones right so when there's nothing happening or like if I put it down for eight hours and come back eight hours later, you will never know that in a video because you would obviously not record eight hours of nothing and put that in the video, right? So that's a huge advantage. And so I might, um, I think that's why I was, I was more inclined towards build videos but i just i wasn't sure how much people were interested in but if people express interest then it's something that we can definitely do um now per ash's idea if we do go into the electrical and we grab something like this this guy is 1800 uh, i do not have for some reason mass on this guy 008 So this is 20,000 and it's 77 kilograms. So if we shrink it to get about, this would be what? Sixty six nine nine four. That's thirty kilograms. Thirty, which is so it's it's pretty much in keeping with the service module tank, which is at thirty four. But mind you, this is service module level one. So, uh, I do think that the procedural wings, when it comes to making at least batteries is kind of broken because again i can just do that i can get fifteen thousand units of charge per and i can drop the mass to strength and get a battery that has this much juice that weighs a kilogram oh you meant that yeah you can do that as well that's it's true that you i i tend i i always forget that you can do that um but yeah you're absolutely right <clears throat> You can just do it like that, and you'll get you'll get the mass value zero, so eight kilograms. But again, this is the the 
point oh oh eight tons a tons would would like a metric ton would be a thousand kilograms so you can just multiply and divide by a factor of a thousand and, and you'll get that value but yeah if you just middle cl middle click then you'll get the immediate value right but i mean you can see just how disproportionate this can get so i th my guess would be that this is kind of broken um but you can also use if you want you can also use these kinds of batteries to do that kind of look um, it's a different look um, i i like to not have the green light visible because i it, again it, it, it depends what, what your tastes are like and I'm, I'm doing like a really kind of botched look here But you can play around with this as well. And if you don't like the way these look on top, um, you can always flip them around as well. And you can play with that appearance if you prefer to have that. Now, in this kind of a context here, this kind of just looks daft. It doesn't really work. But in other types of contexts, it might work. Um, Personally, I find that with the right color scheme, you could probably get something that's a little better looking in this manner here. Um, I think it, it you would get closer to having something like, um, that was, there we go, something like that, right? So you've got the painted tank, which is probably painted white. And then you can make these guys, whatever color you want, like dark gray or stock gray or whatever, right? Um, and then you can get a much more interesting look, in my opinion, if you do that. Um, so doing that, we could get this guy and white paint. It's kind of bright, maybe beige, like that. <clears throat> also using um. Playing around in the in the coloring GUI, like like having playing around with the metallic or the the specular. Specular is how shiny it is. Like this is <laughs> insanely shiny, and it's obviously this is is you know like super glossy white paint, and you would never really see something like that. But that's how I I managed to get this kind of look here right so if you can you can see here when i open the the coloring gooey gooey um sort of what values in terms of the specular and the metallic that i went for so it's got you know it's slightly grimy it's not completely perfectly polished but there's a lot of shine on there um and that's how you get that nice kind of balloon tank wd-40 covered balloon tank on the atlas that they had back in the day and then obviously the entire thing looked like that like the entire thing had that appearance but uh, the kerosene was at the bottom the lower half and or not the lower half with the lower portion of the tank and then the top was the um, where they had the locks so obviously with something as paper thin as the balloon tanks the stainless steel balloon tanks that they used there was no insulation on it for, for maximum weight savings and you would just get this really nice kind of frosty look. And that's why I, I've got that going here. And you can see that the way I, I set this one up is it's not at all, like unlike the tank, it is not glossy at all because frost on a metallic surf surface would not be glossy, right? It would be kind of like a matte color because the surface is just rough and if you got really close to it like if you've ever seen if you've ever seen frost um it's not it's not a a matte color right so this kind of duplicates that appearance but for something like this here this guy is is carolox um so you would you would have something like this at all but you you would never see that that just looks kind of ridiculous so that the specular is what gives you that that's it's basically like how glossy like from super glossy to 
not glossy at all. And, and, and metallic is, well, it's something else. Right. So you can you can really affect the look and the feel of of it like that. And then you can go and with these guys and do the same. And you can maybe put like uh, stock black. I don't dislike because it's got that nice matte black to it. But again, you can play around with that and see what having metallic does or specular. So anyways, this is probably something that you're going to see on on the tank just because I, I really don't dislike this kind of stuff. And in a design like this one where um, what you've essentially got is a big tank, you'll need somewhere to put il the electronic modules on the tank, right? And because they've got all these helium tanks at the bottom, there's not really kind of any room to do that there. If you look at the more modern Centaur upper stage, what they do there is, um, and obviously this is a more modern stage, so it's the electronics are a lot smaller. But a lot of these, a lot of what the electron, where the electronics are located, is actually in the uh, aft portion of of the tank. Um, this is an older design because it's got the dual RL tens. This is what was used, and you can see it here. This is the three stage, stage and a half Atlas. So this is. Atlas Centaur mid 1960s. This was used um, to send the surveyor probes to to the moon and a lot of the Mariner missions and Pioneer and that kind of stuff early on. Um, I think you've got yeah. So you can kind of see some of the avionics modules at the bottom here, some there, one there. Um, this is a, a fairly modern. This is what's on the Atlas V. This is a rather modern design. Um, and then these tanks are the helium tanks, which are used for pressurization, pressurization of the Centaur. Um, and what you're seeing here, these guys like that, these are the RCS pods for maneuvering. So you can see that there, this guy, these guys here, here and here with the red caps on these are and you can see they're really fairly small because you, you don't need that much thrust because you again you're, you're trying to take your time right if we come back to that graph like really at the early on part of the state of the of the stream right the further you are out on your your flight the less power and thrust you need and the more you want to focus on on that efficiency right so the, so understanding this um, relationship between flight time efficiency and power is key to having a really efficient design and you'll see that if you study actual real world designs you'll see that the higher stages have much lower thrust weight values because it's less wasteful to do that you would need high power at the start because you're fighting gravity a lot the rocket is very heavy you need to get moving and you don't want to spend too much time ascending up high while you're fighting gravity at the very start right because that's that becomes very wasteful if you can imagine if your thrust to weight ratio is like close to one you can imagine that your rocket is just going to sit there burning fuel until it's finally able to get light enough right so when you're you're working on higher portion upper stages and this guy would be uh, the thrust away that we'd get off of this guy would not be significantly high would obviously um for a second stage like that you can you can comfortably start with a thrust away value of about 0 0.6 0 0.7 and get a very nice prof acid profile you really don't need to have anything higher than that and it's not necessarily desirable per se to have something higher than that. It depends 
what value you need to have, what kind of power you should have will depend on where the staging happens, right? Um, with the Atlas, uh, the, technically the first staging is a skirt. And then when you actually get rid of this, of this guy, um, and you stage and you, you actually start flying your upper stages, on the Atlas Baker, uh, that staging happens when the rocket was already at an altitude of about 200 kilometers with the perigee being at about minus 3500 and i'm basically just flying uh, manually I'm, I'm manually flying the atlas baker stage just enough keeping just enough vertical speed to maintain my position at apogee and I just fly it until I get a fairly circular orbit, right? Um, so I'm actually in the later part of the f for the for the first half to three quarters of that flight, I'm flying with both XLR 11s at full throttle. But um, as the flight phase continues, I'm actually kind of starting to throttle back just to get a nice insertion at the end. Um, but I typically really very seldom need to fly that stage with a high alpha at the start or, or during because it's got fairly good thrust to weight in that specific case it, it starts off at about close to one which is actually kind of high for an upper stage but it's also not the most efficient upper stage which is why we're kind of doing what we're doing here because we wanted to, to remedy that situation right um something else that I just thought about also to consider is uh, in terms of where you want to place your RCS pods on your stage you typically always will want to have those as far aft so as far down as possible because uh, your center of mass will tend to be in the higher portions right so the the mass is going to be the point at about which it, it it pivots once you're in orbit and by having your rcs pods as far from the center mass as possible again you're increasing that moment arm so the length between the pivot and the application of the force so you're going to get better returns for the uh, firing of, of of every maneuver and the net result of that is you're going to get a much more efficient stage. Um, the reason also why I, I only use these guys for um, pitch and or for and aft, well not 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 aft, but just forward for ollage and and not for um, rotating because if you can imagine the center of mass would be along the center line, so you could use these guys to pivot, right? Uh, but again, your your moment arm is going to be in that case perpendicular distance, so the firing would be that way. So your your perpendicular distance would be this, and that's a fairly short moment arm versus if your center of mass is higher up, because you can imagine you'll have the third stage, you'll have your payload. Um, so by having these further out, then your center of mass would be would be this, you know, from these guys up. So you would tend to have a longer moment arm in that case. Are you still calculating with an entire copy of the second stage? Calculating what? I'm not sure I follow what you're what I'm supposed to be calculating. Yeah, the more the more I look at this guy, the more this feels like overkill to me at this point. Well, the 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 numbers for the thrust to weight that you have to factor in is the actual thrust to weight of the vehicle. So, it's the second stage that's pushing itself, but it's everything else that it's also pushing. So, whatever it's got on top of it is going to affect its thrust to weight because at that point in time 
everything else that's 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 four of the engines is mass everything that's from from the engines all the way to the top of the payload fairings is part of a system right so every component will have an add mass and will affect the thrust to weight right so sure it's not so when i say that the baker upper stage has a thrust rate of about one that is with most payloads that I have put into orbit. You've got more payload on the second stage than I think you'd actually fly with. Um, if I if I understand your comment correctly, and, and let me know if I haven't, what I'm understanding you're saying is in some is instances the rocket will be overkill, over designed for for what you need to do for what you're trying to put into orbit. Is that what you're saying, or did I misunderstand? That would look something like this. And I I like going with the it's tripping out. But I like going with the um, Atlas recolor preset because when you do, it gives you these kind of ridges. And those uh, are basically meant to mimic uh, the kind of, of lateral reinforcements that you would put on on interstage structures to give it that reinforcement so it'll give you that high stiffness the high strength but by but being very light in in itself Oh, no, 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 yeah, no, obviously this rocket will not be capable of 15 to 16 tons to Leo. No, not by, by any means. But the, that 15 to 16 tons that I'm referring to is how much avionics the second stage is going to need to factor in because just the tank itself here is 13 tons. If you factor in the weight of the engines, the weight of this stuff, and whatever third uh, stage and payload it's going to have that avionics unit will have to have something roughly akin to 16 tons um, because most of that is its own weight that it's having to deal with, right? But no, this will not by any means be able to put, no, 16 tons would require like a Titan 3C or something. Um, the Atlas uh, was never capable of that that kind of heavy lifting. Um, I'm not even. I think you, for for that kind of mass, you need like a like a modern five three one or something. But no, no, this is, no, like the heavy lift that we'll be doing in the series once we start putting some rather like, like ten plus, ton cargo, up into orbit. I don't foresee that we'll need to be doing that anytime soon, um, because we're going to be doing. And we should be pretty close to doing crewed missions in the next episode, if not our first. Um, <clears throat> and then for the for the next little while, it's going to be, you know, single seat crewed missions, um, flybys to Mars and Venus, um, <clears throat> uh, and and two seat crewed missions landers on the moon 
that's all stuff we can do with the atlas um, so how is how you so the, per your comment ash um you're saying you should probably, if you're going to be doing math on what that stage's thruster weight is, you should actually have the payload you're designing the launch vehicle for on top. I mean, yeah, yeah, yes, but the, the, the principle still applies that your second, your second stage, irrespective of what it's pushing in terms of a payload, doesn't need to have anything greater than than 0 0.6 0 0.7 thruster weight when it's starting um it it really all depends on when the staging and the start of the second stage in the flight profile begins um, because that will impact how high it is how how fast it still has to go to reach orbital speeds so it'll it when the staging happens affects how fast and how high it's moving at and consequently that has an impact on how much it has to directly or indirectly f fight gravity and depending on your your the overall configuration of your booster you could have a a very nice gravity turn or you could do something like what ULA does with the Atlas V where um, it basically lobs the center upper stage into into its position because the center upper stage is you know very great upper stage super high efficiency like 450 seconds worth of specific impulse because it's hydrolox and the rl 10s are amazing but they're very low thrust to weight and it if it's only got that single one so it doesn't have the thrust to weight the power to, to continue the gravity turn so what it basically has to do is it has to get lobbed into orbit or into a ballistic trajectory and then fly with a bit of a pitch up attitude and lose some altitude but ultimately get into orbit so that's kind of the typically the flight profile that they tend to, to fly with but um you know if you look at either the center on the atlas 5 or the upper stage on the falcon 9 it they use the same stage regardless of the mission they're flying, right? So from one satellite to the next, it'll impact the thrust weight that the second stage has because every mission is going to be different. Every mission is going to have a different mass to push into orbit. So that's why for every single mission, they have to recalculate and reestablish what the optimal ascent profile for that mission will be because they're using the same rocket for a variety of different of different payloads different orbits and at, that have different masses right um so every ascent profile will be slightly different um and i tend to mimic that characteristic in kerbal space program where um, my atlas baker i've flown a bunch of times but i've flown a variety of different types of, of payload and payload masses but um, the fly profile will change ever so slightly for every mission, but there's a range within a continually operate because that's the capacity that rocket and that, that upper stage has. It's, so it's not always just a matter of pure delta V output because you have to have a certain power capacity for every stage right once you're in orbit it's a different story you can take your sweet time if you want to produce whatever kind of delta v changes you you need if you want a 10 minute burn to produce a 50 meter per second change in delta v you can do that once you're in orbit because you've got the time but when you're when you're trying to get into orbit uh, you cannot allow yourself to get past apogee when you're 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 still not into orbit because once you get past apogee, your rocket is going to start to lose altitude. And if you don't have enough thrust and power on that stage at that point and you're past apogee, you're not going to be able to keep up and you're, you're going to fall back down to earth and it's going to be a bad time, right? So you have to be able to 
to optimize and to configure your 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 ASIN profile for every rocket and more or less for every mission. Um, my Atlas Baker in, on certain instances has been overkill for the mission that I was trying to do. It was more power than I needed, um, but that's really not kind of a problem. That's not where you're gonna you're not gonna lose much money by by doing it that way, right? You're just going to have more fuel left into orbit or not. Um, but on some instances, my, my, my bigger upper stage will have 5% fuel left. And in other instances, it'll have 15, 20% fuel left, depending on what kind of orbit I'm going for and what kind of profile I'm, I'm, I'm or payload I'm flying, right? Um, but again, that's, that's really not much of a problem. Um, it, it's reusing the same hardware again and again and again is how you get the best bang for buck because the Atlas Baker and this rocket eventually will have a range of payload capabilities for Leo and a range of payload capabilities for Geo and for TLI and that kind of stuff, right? And then you basically use whatever rocket is optimal for each mission. But when you're on the higher end of that range capability of your rocket, you're gonna use it more completely. You're gonna push it to its limits, but if you're on the lower end, you're just gonna have some fuel left over when you actually get the orbit. So your rocket will have been a little over designed, but that's just the way it goes. Like in reality, you can never have a rocket that's exactly what it needs to be for every mission. It's always within a certain range. And that's why ULA has a philosophy of they modularize the launch vehicle configuration by either adding or removing SRBs on the Atlas V, on the Atlas V, right? So from zero to five SRBs, depending on what they need the mission to be, so that it's every SRB increases that range by a certain amount, right? So. Yeah, I've not, I've actually not, is that always a problem? Is that potentially an efficient way of doing things? It tends to go past Apogee to get into a specific orbit. The thing is, I've not seen MegJab PVG in action that much because I use Gravity Turn. And the only reason why I use Gravity Turn is, this is going back to 131, I think, when is when I started using it. I was having so many issues when I was trying to replicate a stage and a half on the Atlas with MegJab. And I was just having issues with MegJab, period. And I think this was before they had PVG on it. So I kind of got fed up with it. Somebody had talked to me about Gravity Turn. I started using it and it was perfect. It did the job. So I kind of never went back to using MegJab. And I've heard more than once that it has issues with the stage and a half. And I just haven't been... I haven't gone through the trouble of troubleshooting or, or testing MegJab PVG with my Atlas to see how well, how friendly it would be. And I don't know that I necessarily want to take the time right now. Gravity Turn does a really, really good job, to be completely honest. It's, it's a fairly efficient thing. Most flight profiles won't involve this kind. Yeah, no, no, typically not. And Felix, it's good to see you. Happy you could join. I don't know how when you joined the the, the stream, but uh, we were just about to call it call it a night. Um, so yeah, I think I think I'll stop it here. It's at three hours, and I'm getting I'm starting to get a little tired. Um, we it's four hours actually. We started at five. Yeah. Um, so what I'll do is I will uh, I will record myself finalizing the design, and then those of you who are interested, uh, I'll I'll create another playlist on the channel which will be like a builder series or something like that, and then you guys, uh, if you're interested at all in seeing the rest of the build and how it goes, uh, I will produce a video that you will be able to to enjoy hopefully. Um, so it's 9 p.m. We're, we're really right on the four hour mark. So let's call it a night for now. Hopefully this was something that was at least at least moderately enjoyable for you guys. Um, I always want it to be at least moderately enjoyable and also um, informative in some way.
So I hope that it was it was both of those. So that's going to be it. I'm just going to let the stream roll for just a little bit because I want to see if there are any comments on chat. But I will um, wish you guys a fantastic weekend. Um, thanks again for, for coming on the stream and for uh, chatting and for watching the videos, liking and commenting. Again, it's super encouraging. And um, thanks again. Build videos will be highly informative and jolly good fun. Good stuff as usual. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, much appreciated. Uh, I feel the love. And I will catch you guys uh, soon. And keep your heads up, uh, or eyes open, rather, is what I was trying to say. <laughs> keep your eyes open for the build video where we uh, finalize this design and come up with the what will be the next generation of rockets in the series, the one that will um, uh, be the successor to our currently pretty successful Atlas Baker rocket. Um, send me your naming suggestions. Um, Atlas is obviously going to stay, but Baker is where we are going to require a new name for the upper stage so um so yeah yeah i'm glad you also like the drawings um so yeah i'll see you guys around and send me your naming suggestions if you've got ideas for a good upper stage name um who knows we could maybe you know grab the, the 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 four or five that i like the most and and put up a poll on reddit and see what people come up with and we can maybe have some fun with that naming So anyways, I was just reading the chat. Sorry for that, uh, <laughs> that, that quiet part. Anyways, for the last time, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, thanks for, for being a part of the stream. Had a good time tonight. And uh, it's Friday where I am, Saturday or Sunday where you guys are. Or it's not Sunday, but Saturday or Friday. So enjoy the weekend, guys. And I will see you again. Keep your eyes open for the build video. Cheers.